All right. Well, here we are, ladies and gents. Second series in Hidden Cup 5. Best players in the world, all on hidden identities. And we already had speculations on the draft. We already were thinking a lot on maybe this player could be, yo, this player could be me high or something based on their civilizations. But we've got to see the gameplay here. And in the red, we've got Saman Guru playing as the Franks. And then in the blue, we've got Jean Biro, both players from history, of course, and uh, <clears throat> or, or heroes from history, rather. And we've got some players playing under their names here uh day nine but the map is slopes and this is going to be one that i think you would like it's a little bit more land-based a little bit more army action oh, a little more land-based i'm one of those people that's like wait you can make boats in this game <laughs> like <laughs> that is uh, the kind of thing that i feel like makes you need to have that intense multitasking right from the very very start but i mean i want to yeah. ignore the civilizations that we're specifically looking at anytime i see a map I want to understand like what the long-term goals are generally going to be. Like in a map like Gold Rush, yep. obviously controlling the center gold, all paths are going to lead to that. But you know, when I just take a look at this map, there is there is a sort of Arabia-esque quality about it, minus the fact that there's these high grounds on the on the top and bottom. Like what are what are sort of like the big features that in your mind need to be focused on uh, if you're playing here? So, so initially on slopes, you have the food on the sides, right? Food is, is like the most important resource at the start. Players are trying to get as much right. as they can. And you can see here, Suman Guru is just going to push in the deer. Now, on both sides, the players will have two shore fish and four deer to be able to, to take control of. And obviously, if you go out there with vills and mill that, you're getting the shore fish as well. It's, it's more food in total. Um, but... I think it's going to be rare for players to want to take that risk because the opponent's going to know that and the opponent can then prioritize focusing on that area. Uh, more often than not, we've seen players shift towards just pushing in as much as they reasonably can and then not worrying about it later. Now, what I think then where the focus shifts, and this is where it really depends on how you want to approach it, is there's a lot of reason to go up to that hill and expand your economy later on with all the wood and the safety. But there's also a lot of reason through the middle. If you look at the middle here, where all the, the gold is, we'll see it. There's gold and stone through the very middle of this map everywhere. And that can lead to castle drops yeah. too. So you're, it's kind of tough to know. You have a lot of options here. Yeah, I mean, especially like given how spare the wood lines are, it feels so scary to try to just toss a mill up right by that deer and that fish. I mean, it feels like it makes yeah, sense yeah. if you're Sumanguru to pick Franks on this map. They have the mobility of the cavalry. They have that early map control. Maybe you want to transition straight into controlling that high ground right away. But I mean, in the series that we saw this morning, both players did a pretty tight low ground wall instead of trying to do this. And look, Sumanguru going straight for the fish. Yeah, and it's really interesting, right? Because he's pushing baller. in the deer from the other side. So he's getting the food boost to the other side. And now he's milling. So, and this is also Franks that have cheap farms. Or not cheap farms, right. rather. That would be Tutans. <laughs> they have the, I'm like going to confuse everybody here. Um, no, it. they have the free farm upgrades. So I think that tells us here that Sumanguru is going to go aggressive here. He might spend a lot of this food into scouts, like you said. So I want to I wanna come back to what you were mentioning earlier about the complexities of these Castle Age units. How, how is that going to impact this game? Well, so Franks have an outrageous economy. They have an outrageous right, right. switch into knights and, and pikemen usually. And they've got the cheap the, castle. The so only every, civilization every... I play. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally about to say every low elo legend knows how good the Franks could be with their castles and their knights. And then I realized who I was talking to. So I'll uh, take a the step The lowest back elo legend of all, players. baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th that's great. Where Franks struggle is against ranged units. And so um, the Spanish, they have the they have the faster builders. So for those walls we talked about, I think the fast walling can be helpful to defend you from the scouts. And then they have the Conquistador. And the Conquistador is one of the toughest units for any save to counter, especially the Franks who have very weak skirmishers. So I think the Franks player, you know those games where you have like your your four to five scouts into walls into a relaxed oh, type of I'm castle so cool. build. oh yeah yeah 
I, I don't think the Frank player will want that here. I think that is very risky. Ah, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, th this is the well, sort of thing the, that I think uh, that... Swordfish there. Yeah, no, I mean, like, that, that to me is a huge moment because, I mean, RTS games, in my eyes, are all about holding positions for long periods of time. So even just seeing a single building out there immediately means... All right, unless you want to just abandon the mill, bring all the workers back, and then wall in. I mean, this probably means Sumanguru is going to be planting a flag there right away. So if you're Jean yep. Bureau, you now immediately have options of where you want to pressure. And I mean, like, you know, obviously Franks tend to want to favor cavalry. We see the stable already done for Sumanguru. But Jean Bureau here, what's the kind of focus for Spanish in this situation? Yeah, you are definitely realizing... Um, the, the bonuses the opponent has and you don't at this stage. Um, but understanding that as long as you don't take damage in Feudal Age, that Castle Age looks really good for you here. Because Spanish, you, you get 20 gold per tech. So as you advance throughout the game, you're getting more techs, getting more gold. Um, again, the Conquistadors are there. Their tech tree is actually really, really good in late game. So the focus now, you sometimes you just have to accept, hey, my Scout Rush might not be as strong. But still, go for your own scout rush and still play towards some level of aggression here. And we've got scouts from Semanguru. And this is the first time we're really going to get to see how the damage control focus is for these guys. Some players fight off with villagers just like that. Like, that was super confident. Right. Other players are going to just add a couple extra spearmen. Yeah, and no, I already see a spearmen so up there. A lot of damage right here. The mill and wood lines getting threatened just kind of poking around trying to find anything that they can and i feel like this is this is something that all, all the top players are so good at is these little tiny micro decisions where they still avoid taking one strike of damage from a scout uh any spearman and looking at mm -hmm. this position i really feel like this is a hallmark of high level players too that they don't wall overly early they just start to wall as they're in the middle of feudal age and oh four scouts versus four scouts this is not something that i feel like i see very often where there's just a bunch of scouts tons of open space on a map and <laughs> no one's yet quite able to pressure yeah they, it's calculated pressure right they're like okay i i don't need, i know where my opponent's army is so i don't need to have six villagers walling whereas a lot of people watching might just be like i have no clue where they're gonna go <laughs> i hope they're not here and <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I can get these walls down. <laughs> and it's going to be the biggest wall you've ever seen. It's going to encompass half the map. Yeah, true. It's going gonna, it's gonna to include, like, as many golds as possible. But then they're going to die yeah. before they can ever take any of those golds. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And all the while being as greedy as I can, my heart is pounding and sweat's dripping off my forehead. Got to get these walls up in time. <laughs> Don't have enough wood to make a single building. I'm broke. I'm getting housed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's good to know. It sounds like this is coming from a place of experience. And I've watched you play Franks and Ethiopians pretty much primarily. So I know you've got oh, your archers it. and you've... your scouts down. And another villager exposed here. We did see a villager go down earlier for Jean Bureau. And I'm noticing a little bit of um, hesitancy to be aggressive, right? Has been sitting at home. Has now lost two villagers. So we said the Franks wanted to have a good early feudal age here and certainly has found it now the scout engagement happens bloodlines is in for jean bureau but i don't think this is a bad fight for suman guru at all yeah i mean suman guru like yeah you're maybe not getting as much value out of the scouts but i mean just trading away units especially trading away mobile yep. units is sort of like a secret way to feel secure about taking more territory back at home. Now, losing all your scouts like like Sumanguru just did, oh, Jean Bureau, now it's going to be the exact opposite. Instead of trading scouts, now you're up scouts. I mean, what is it? It's going to be four to one. So now all of a sudden that that mill that's all, all the way on that far right, and that's exposed. That's dangerous now. Now it's time for Jean yeah, Bureau we'll to see... put on the pressure, baby. I'm also very curious to see if those vills stay there, right? Because the scouts yeah. are a bit weaker. The spearmen are there. I feel like, having played this map a lot, I never know what to do with those three or four villagers there. And sometimes players will, if they're in Castle Age, they'll just keep the villas there and build the TC. But, like, eventually, I gotta think those villas are gonna have to go home. And, wow, it looks like... You see the spearmen get microed there? He's very well aware the scouts would be headed directly over there. Yeah. Very yeah. nice defense from Simangru, who behind this is actually gonna go... Or Archer Switch with the Franks. 
Ah, interesting. Now, this, this is far too high skill for me. I have no ability to analyze this at all. Why would Franks go for an Archer Switch right now after the failed Scout Rush? Why wouldn't you just go, well, that sucks, and then just go to Castle Age and make Cavalry like a proper adult Frank player? <laughs> well, I, I, again, I think it's the matchup, right? Like, I think if you... If there's the threat of Conquistadors on the other side, you are terrified that if you just simply oh, go Knights, that right. the Conquistadors are going to pull it back. Now, I think also... When there's walls, crossbows become much stronger, right? Archers, because when when there's walls down, knights can't break through, and especially at this level, you're gonna see like house walls and quick walls, whatever. So full sure, wall sure. scenarios, archers can be very strong, and and now Jean Bureau is gonna have to prep some extra fortifications. Yeah, and I mean at this point, I mean Sumanguru did lose a lot of those scouts, and we see Jean Bureau putting on some pressure. Oh no, the classic look away for one second and a single spearman picks <laughs> off three scouts immediately! Oh my god, this is this is so familiar. I'm getting flashbacks to most of my games. Where did my scouts go? I'm hitting the hotkey for my scouts, and my screen is staying in my base, and I'm like, what's happening? Something is wrong. And I get on Twitter and yeah, I talk yeah. about pathing immediately before I realized I lost all of them to a single spearman. Ugh. Yeah. But I mean now this that's pressure relatable from to all of us. Guru, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean the the archers well, moving well, forward. Well, think about it. Okay, so counter. think about it this way. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here, right? Because you're talking a lot about your experiences. You have yeah. been told conquistadors are strong with Spanish, but you see archers. Where do you build the castle? Right. But I, I should ask that a earlier I, to really put you on the spot. I but. build it there. <laughs> I build it right there, Tristan. That's where I would build it. And I'm glad Jean Bureau <laughs> wow, agrees wow. with me. You That's got what so I would much do. potential. Yeah, I, I don't mean, know if you know, you know this, but it, I'm it a was gamer, something that If the ca if Castle Age came in a minute faster for Smungru there, that castle might have been in trouble. So that's why I brought it up. But there it is. I mean, Conquistadors are gonna be on the way. It's a really strong unit, and I think Jean Viro. This is why he picked the Spanish. This is kind of the position he wanted to be in. He would have wanted to avoid losing those two villagers, though. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the most interesting aspects of Age of Empires compared to other RTS games is that you can only get additional town centers once you get to Castle Age, which means mm -hmm. you can't just sneak in an extra hatchery or nexus in the way you could in the StarCraft series. Like, losing a single worker in the early game has that compounding effect that you really feel it. You yep. can't make up for that anytime soon. So, I mean... Losing those two yep. villagers is huge. Conquistador picks off that final scout. And, I mean, that that castle right there for Jean Bureau, I mean, right away, I feel like in Castle Age, there's that question of where do you want your territory to expand? Obviously, Sumaguru sort of expanding back with those two town centers. But that first castle is just such a strong linchpin for any position that Jean Bureau can then just yeah, really is up and left and just have this giant wall of castles with the Conquistadors bouncing between. I mean, that is... Oh, wow. And a crossbow counter on the left side. I'm curious to see the reaction time here from Jean Bureau, if, he, if he's expecting this. And he does react right away because he hasn't seen the crossbows in a while. He's been running through the middle of the map. And now he sees it. He's going to prep some houses behind. Sumanguru sees the houses are going up. So he starts to attack the Vils. Beautiful micro here. But yeah, I mean, listen, the, the, the approach right now could not be more different for both players. We've got... An expensive unique unit, but a strong unique unit being the choice of Jean Bureau. And then Sumanguru, eventually Crossbow will not look good for him if this game goes late. But he's got all this eco behind it. Three TC spamming Vils. So he needs to take good enough fights. Because if he start, if he has bad engagements, he's going to have no map control here. And that could be really dangerous against the Spanish. Look, look at the foresight from Sumanguru. Oh, this is great. Already double layering those walls with houses. Because, I mean, obviously yep. Conquistador's super mobile, so you can sweep around and deny someone trying to slip a TC or a castle too far out of the base. But with the range, they can also pressure heavily against any villager that's trying to re-wall off, having all that done in advance. And, oh, dude, this is, this is why I feel like mobile units, like any form of cavalry is just so nice to have in an open map. Yeah. You just 
get so much information. If your opponent makes a single mistake, you can punish it immediately. And all Ooh. these units just getting picked off one by one. I Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I do love, though, oh, God. This is where we're going to see our first big crossbow micro moment in Hidden Cup 5, honestly. This is a tough situation for Smenguru to get himself out of. Oh, and it, it's definitely a situation where he's going to lose it, but it's how long can he avoid losing everything? <laughs> I mean, it's it's just a matter of time. This is like if you're in a 2v2 and you say to your teammate, just die slowly, okay? I just need a little yeah, more yep, time, yep. right? These crossbows... Buddies, you did great work. Just die as slowly as you can. But man, look look at these conquistadors. I mean, they just they're they're like the best punishing unit I've seen now that I've learned they're that insane. it exists. Yeah, they're they're, they're insane. It's it's so good. And there's players that love their unique unit play. And we talked about yeah. the draft of Jean Bureau and how as so many civilizations which will have a unit out of the castle that's strong. And I think in this moment, we are going to see Jean Viriel go forward here. But there's another army no. coming forward. And this castle oh. that he wants to go for might be too risky. Oh, I mean, that is beautiful. I mean, the, the double archery range allows you to quickly build skirmishers in an emergency. This is brilliant from Sumon Guru, just a pressure. Because look at this. The pressure coming through the middle allows this top left TC to go down. And it's in a sneaky position, but yep. a single scout is spotted at Sumon Guru. It's trying to get that up as fast as possible while also trying to delay this pressure as much as possible. And I mean, I think this is so cute from Jean Bureau. You saw him try to start a TC at the left side on the high ground, immediately canceled that and is just going hard for this push yep. i mean it's gonna be four yeah, and, and it's town like, centers versus one that scout's going to work going to town over there clearly they're both looking here and this is the moment the people cannot look away if this castle goes up it will be directly on the tc the stone and the gold he's 20 villagers behind it might not be 20 because of the scout but 20 villagers behind john biro and even with only six or seven bills i think this castle will actually go up right now I mean, it's gonna go up, but I mean, these skirmishers, oh, oh, the mangonels getting picked off, but not before. No, no, no other shot does manage to blast off. And at this point in time, the conquistadors are so good at cleanup. Yes, skirmishers counter, but I mean, it doesn't matter if you're just getting all the control of this space to where you can now place down this castle. And at this point, I'm looking at the situation Jean Bureau's in. I mean, again, as a low elo player, if a castle goes down this close to my base, I immediately have blood in my eyes. I'm so stressed out. But, I mean, you see some <laughs> gurus mining a bunch of stone, going to probably place an internal castle and pull back. And, I mean, do you want to be Suman Guru in this situation where you're ahead 74 vils to 56? Or do you want to be Jean Bureau putting the pressure on? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tricky, right? Because the vil count's huge. It's not near as crazy because that MVP scout was picking away, but... I think you've got to go with the Spanish, right? I think, like, this unit, we already established that the Franks, the, the whole skirmisher crossbow play actually gets worse for them as the game goes on. And now, he doesn't have many of them, and that's really his only option to hold against this. It feels like Jean Biro is going to dictate the pace of this game. And the other tricky thing about all these castles being where they are is you want counter damage as a player in, in Suman Guru's position. Where are you supposed to go? Uh, right. There's going to be TCs everywhere. There's going to be two castles. Like, you're just completely stuck. What's the speed difference between knights and conquistadors? Um, Really put me on the spot there. I think it's similar. I think they're both 1.43 speed. Uh, but we sure, would have sure. to get a knight on the field for me to be able to verify that. I mean, and, it's I mean, like... I, I really... I am feeling the pain of being against Conquistadors here because, I mean, the Conquistadors were yeah. sweeping all the way to the right side where we're looking right now, Then they're sweeping to the left side, just making sure, oh, you have a TC there and nothing else good, I'll come back around. I mean, this, this scooping constant. pressure left and right. Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, and look at this brilliant move from Jean Bureau. Behind all of this, throws down two TCs. Just immediately Are trying gonna to see seize as much map control. Big attack round there as well. And I think we're going to see another forward castle. Like, this is actually at a point where I think you can kind of chill and be somewhat okay. But he says, I have no chill, for I am Jean Bureau, and I am here to build them oh. on your face, and Suman Guru is going to drop his own castle. But this castle no. might not end up going up here. 
Oh, it's only three villagers for Jean Bureau, and we have a castle that is here just to protect this single TC. There's the Mangonel, there's the Conquistadors, it's almost halfway done at this point. And we see villagers, man, everyone is going to work right now. Everyone yeah, this, needs this, to this get this castle be, up. This could be doubt versus doubt. Both castles could fail in some way, shape, or form. I mean, the castle right now for Samanguru is at 80%. It feels like this one will go up. Villagers from Look everywhere are coming to complete this. <laughs> oh. And then when this castle oh completes, my God. when the other castle complete, I think the other castle will go oh. up as well. So people were speculating on who these players might be. It is confirmed not to be doubt because the castle is actually completed. But uh, man, what a crazy moment that was. Um, you know, whenever there's two castles just shooting at each other with like, you know, a few tiles between them, it reminds me of like 15 years ago on Facebook when you'd have someone you'd have a crush on and you'd poke them. And then they would poke you back and then you would poke them and both of you would be too frightened to talk to each other because you were young and hormonal yep. like this is what these castles yep. are going to do they're going to poke for about three and it years it accomplishes nothing right yeah exactly yeah, it, it goes regret. nowhere yeah mm -hmm. absolutely um I, I, what i love about suman guru's play here i mean he's in a brutal spot in some ways but he's actually imping he's on the way to imp he has skirms coming wow. over to defend this tc if he can get trebs out of that castle he can actually both castles. He could, in theory, treb down the castles from John Biro, still have a villager lead, and be in the Imperial Age before his opponent. I mean, this this is brilliant. This is this is such calm from Sumanguru. Again, peeling what 25, 30 villagers just to complete that castle in the top left, and then going. Yeah. Anyways, I was ahead on economy, and then just blasting out more TCs. And look at this, <gasps> Petards getting built out of the castle. Are they both building Petards? <laughs> They're both, so it's the double Petard. It's the double Petard. Both players know that this could turn into a Treb War. Jean Biro knows he's not on the way to Imp, so there's a lot of reason to try and stop that big engagement here. The Skirms getting rocked by the Manganel. This is this is what we said. And then on the other side, the Petards go oh, through. So no. we've got Rams, we've got Petards. It's possible Simon Guru will lose that castle. His Petards might not go in close then. And then on the other side... The Conquistadors are still advancing forward for Jean Biro. And we got a panic TC now from Sumanguru. I mean, Sumanguru oh, is still just trying to leverage the lead that Sumanguru has. Hey, I got four TCs yeah. early. I probably have a lead in economy. I know I've lost a lot of villagers, but <laughs> if I was going for economy now and can keep going all in on that, then maybe I can get Imperial Age, start pushing back out with trebuchets. And if I have enough town yeah. centers stabilizing, I'll be good. And I actually feel like Sumanguru decided, yep, I'm losing this TC like five or six minutes ago. So now all these battering rams are a little awkward, kind of, you know, orphaned off here in the top side of the map. And I mean, Jean Bureau, though, has set the pace of this entire game. I mean, this Conquistador oh. Manganel pushing, oh, this is brutal to see. I mean, he was 30 vils behind and now has killed 35 villagers and it's about dead even, but it also, at the same time, it's not in that one player's an imp. So it, it, this is a situation where if Sumanguru wasn't Franks, he's in an amazing position because his skirms get much better. But you don't get Bracer, right? You don't even get Final Armor. So, so your skirms aren't really getting that much better. But still, being an imp, having the ability to make trebs is nice. He just still has to focus on all this pressure all the time. It's just so difficult. I, I, I do not know how both players have played this game from their situations, right? Like, one player being 30 bills behind, yeah. I would be dead. The other player getting castle dropped multiple times, I would also be dead. It's incredible. And I feel like, you know, every good player in a strategy game wants to do something good right now, but always know what the next step is. And when your next step yeah, starts yeah. slowly getting picked off one by one, like right now, Sumanguru, hey, yeah, you got Imperial Age. You have the trebuchets, you have four town centers, but what units are you literally going to go for in Imperial Age to try to do anything except stay alive? I mean, how many mm -hmm. stables does Sumanguru have? I mean, this is a great response. Just having some little poking villagers finally pick some stuff off. Oh man, that's next level building an outpost right there. This guy's too good. But like at this hey, point- He's trying to get like, vision. Yeah, there's not, there's not infrastructure. There's not stables or barracks or archery ranges, almost any production structure. So this feels like Sumanguru is still minutes away from being able to begin to apply pressure. Yeah, agreed.
at the same time, taking out two castles is no joke. And we see the stable switch yeah. from John Bureau that's going to be amazing against skirmishers from Franks. But even but these castles going down for John Bureau, that tells that actually gives an idea to the opponent what John Bureau can't make anymore. So the Conquistador, less of a threat long term, and he too is going to add stables. Now this is this is what you expected right at the start. You want to see some freaking stable spam. We might see it from both. Expected is just you're so generous as a co-caster, T90. Let me just say, <laughs> like I expected this because I am nothing. As a I am player, nothing that's... if not generous. I know, I know. What a sweetheart! Wow, that's what I expected. It's because it's the one unit I make. That's why I expected. It. <laughs> hey, he's doing the same thing I'm doing. I'm just as good. I'm like the idiot drunk dad at the baseball game that's just wearing the team's jersey. I bet this guy's going to build a bunch of cavalry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is this is hey, some next level really game. Respects in Guru. Let's be honest, though. Everyone respects that dad at the baseball game way more than the dad who cares way too much. So, that's right. It's he, all good. He is the economic buoy. His consumerism fuels those players' salaries, and that's what we're here for today. <laughs> we want to give all the attention to the gods of AOE too. So, relics are going to start to get picked up here through the middle. Things are very open right now for Smenguru. I could see getting a castle in the middle being realistic for him. He's expanded his eco though so well behind all that pressure he received. Remember, he lost like 40 villagers. Somehow he's still not dead. Unbelievable. He's going for Cavalier. He's got hand cannons. I'm noticing that Jean Bureau actually didn't make a single knight yet. Like, it took a really long time to actually queue up the knights, but he ah. does have upgrades in. He does have the stables prepped, so he should have big numbers soon. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just looking at the army tab i mean 42 units from sumanguru i mean it's so easy yep. to just feel the pressure from jean bureau in the form of the castles and the conquistadors bouncing around but there are seven units total from jean bureau right now seven i mean if sumanguru holds on and pushes back and look at this two relics already picked up so long-term advantage sumanguru will slowly yeah. begin chipping ahead as gold begins to dry up i mean this is an extraordinary stabilization from sumanguru now, now, here's where the problem can come in, right? You see your army counts high, you see your scores high, you have all this momentum. But you made 24 skirmishers because your opponent had conquistadors. And so 24 of that military is doing one damage now, and that's not all that exciting. Now, we do have the rare appearance of the petards in battle <laughs> from Sumenguru. Unbelievable. This, this will not do a lot of damage, guys, so don't get too excited. As a kid, I would send in the petards thinking that an explosive barrel would actually do a lot uh only tends to do a lot versus buildings <laughs> but there we I have mean, it anyways <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah this is this is not something pathetic like concrete these are horses tristan of course they can withstand an explosion <laughs> it's not a big deal true yeah true cavalier v cavalier for spanish do get fully upgraded paladins themselves but we don't see the Paladin upgrade on the way right now for Jean Bureau. It is on the way for Smanguru, and the Franks get the best Paladins in the game. But it does make me think, if you're only on Paladin, and there's another castle coming up for the Spanish, can we see Cavalier and Conquistador beat simply Paladin? I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I really feel like the tension is ratcheting up as we're heading into this post-Imperial Age where... Who will get the dominant control over the gold in the map? I mean, this is a little awkward. Yep. Uh, this this bizarro fight in the middle with a bunch of cavalry running back and forth, giving each other the nod as the trebuchets do all the work. There's that single relic in the middle. And I mean, that that can be a decider if this game does wind up staling out for the next 10 minutes. And they're spending so much on gold, right? Like, gold so is, is everything they're spending. We don't have a single trash unit anymore. Paladin is in for Smanguru. That's probably going to surprise John Bureau. And there go the Paladin. They're going to take the engagement solely, I think, to take out the Treb so we can take out the castle. And it, honestly, I don't think the fight is that bad for John Bureau because Conquistadors are insane. But he must be worried now that the castle has fallen oh, no. that he could lose stuff. But look at the blue inside Smanguru's base. There are Cavalier in there, killing villagers. We have to keep an eye on that as well. Sumanguru is still being raided, but I think that was noticed. Oh, no. The castle's there, the monks are still there, so he's okay. This push is terrifying if it were not for that one castle that was placed exactly where I called it. 
And at this yeah, point, Sumo yeah. Guru can advance forward. I think has three, four trebuchets that are going to be able to begin barreling down this castle. And I mean, if Jean Bureau can stabilize, that was a lot of uh, economy damage. But now all of a sudden, oh my god, this wood line is just getting shredded. And all of a sudden, everyone's having flashbacks. They're like, I've made conquistadors. I made this. How are Franks still so good? Why are Franks still so good? And this is why the Franks were picked. This is why Samanguru took the eco approach so he could have the eco to do this. And now he has killed more villagers of Jean Bureau than Jean Bureau did to him. I mean, he's just shot out of a cannon and he's got full map control right now. And we're seeing conquistadors starting to get masked up again from Jean Bureau. I mean... Maybe Conquistadors with kiting, holding position, can be enough to stabilize. And we see some light cat yep. sneaking around the top side for Jean Bureau as well. And anytime you see a player getting shoved in at the front, building more farms on the side, trying to stabilize out on the side. But I mean, Sumanguru has now brought Jean Bureau down to 110 workers. Yeah, also, fun fact, the uh, Jean Bureau tried to research supremacy, which makes his villagers very strong but it didn't complete. <laughs> so these are normal villagers <laughs> with a lot of false confidence here. <laughs> yeah, these, these, are, these are, are a lot of board eight uh, holders. There it is. Oh, wow. man, the GG is called. And what a beautiful first game to start off the series. It really felt like with the matchup and everything I know about it and the aggression that John Bureau dished out that Sumangru was going to be broken, whoever this Sumangru player is, extremely good at staying alive and expanding that economy and he ends up getting the win in the first game and this is the first sighting of bay in hidden cup five happy to see it again we have simon guru who's gone for the italians and then we have jean bureau who's gone for the mongols and those who have watched this map in the past when there were fewer civilizations when the meta had changed when players had different strengths and weaknesses you will remember this matchup this matchup happened quite a few times uh this map just to break it down, you've got the immediate water focus as the water uh, separates the two players, but the water will eventually run dry. And the, um, <clears throat> you know, it is something that then means if you're focusing on it, is your, fo sorry, if you're focusing on the water, you're not focusing on the expansion to the other areas right. of the map. So yet again, it's like pros and cons. I think Mongols are gonna be more suited towards the land because of the hunt bonus and the scouting bonus. And then the Italians, because of their water prowess, probably gonna focus a bit more on the water. You know, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about this best of seven dynamic where, you know, if you're Jean Bureau, you pointed out that Jean Bureau chose a lot of civilizations with unique castle units. And we were talking a lot before the series began of preparation. Any time I have ever been in any tournament ever. You know, in StarCraft, it was typically four maps in the map pool. Uh, you know, and you'd want to plan a unique strategy for each map. But there's always the one map that you're like, yeah, this is my best one. This is the one where I really got the drop on my opponent. Mm -hmm. And if you're playing that in the first match, and I mean, it really felt like Jean Bureau had a very specifically prepared strategy. Getting Conquistadors, doing this Mangonel push, dropping the castle and effectively containing Suman Guru for what, 10, 15 minutes? If you do that and then lose, I mean, that is one of the most demoralizing experiences going into game number two. You were supposed to win. You know, like it's yeah. the first map that I chose. I got, I, I got to know that I would play on this map because it was chosen before bans. And that's the sort of momentum killer that at least for me, as someone desperately always looking for an excuse to choke, um, that always really winds up affecting me mentally yeah no and i can see that i think where that really comes into play like i think you know after the first game jean bureau will be like okay i lost two vills in dark age i was close if this or that goes differently i actually could have won that and so that those thoughts that you have doesn't necessarily creep in just yet but i think having mongols here if you then get broken then you're down two games then you're like oh shoot like mongols on bay yep spanish on um <clears throat> on slopes like that was my whole game plan and it hasn't worked and that is where the doubt really starts to seep in but i i'm hoping for jean brio that right now we're not he, he's not doubting himself because that can affect your game plan you can throw strategies out the window if you feel like oh this player is way better than me this idea that i had will never work yeah yeah no i mean 
mental fortitude at this point when you're getting into this game and to shut out from your brain any thoughts about the previous game this is like i think one of the most difficult skills in a tournament setting mm -hmm. and you know since we're so since we're you know something funny Bay, we're oh no, no Tristan, sorry please. just continue oh, my goodness. i think my, my... Sorry, the audio, uh, we we're having an issue with an audio delay between us, and we keep, like, you ever know the issue? Like, like you're like, here, let me hold the door. No, after you. No, after you. No, after you. <laughs> we had that for a moment there. Yeah. But, um, Yo once, who's a player who I think Jean Bureau could be because of all of his drafting and his Civ preferences so far. I, I talked to him before the final NAC5, and I was like, hey, like, what are you thinking about, dude? Like, where's your mind at? And Yo goes... I try not to think. And that to me Ooh, is zen. hilarious because I can't do that. I have to like think about all the specifics of everything. Yo just said, I try not to think. I mean, that's, that is actually great advice for anyone who wants to be competitive is to just not put too much stock in any one particular game. You'll get better over time. Mm -hmm. You just have to make sure that you're not over stressing yourself out to where you are unable to play for long sessions and unable to get that learning in. I mean, especially if you're trying to prepare for a tournament, being able to get value out of every single practice game can really wind up burning players out before they've even gotten into game one of the round of 16. Try not to. Yep, think. agreed. Yep, well, that's that's a yo quote. We'll see if there's any more yo tendencies here. Jean Bureau in Feudal Age Faster and being in Feudal Age Faster gives him this opportunity to delay this dock and attack that scout. And he's already making fire galleys out of two docks. So I was wondering, would we see the Mongols prioritize a bit more of the hunts? And we haven't seen that just yet for Jean Bureau. This is a really nice start though. Like he is going to get the edge and a big edge on water against the Italians, who's also double committing to water at the moment. Man, okay, so, so this is where I really want to try to understand how to think about these early water dynamics. Because obviously, if you build fishing ships, it's kind of like the dock is a mini town center. Oh my gosh, no way! The scout picks off two. And of course, the historically accurate final sword swipe to sink the ship. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious your thoughts about like, how do you think about this kind of burst of food from the bay? like? Does it mean that you generally wind up trying to get the food in order to have a really substantial push to castle age, or is it to try to do more feudal age pressure? Like, how how is someone supposed to think about these, you know, boat battles that we're seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, I I think that the big logic behind why people will contest this is sometimes not even because they want it. It seems weird to say this, but because they don't want their opponent to have it, right? Um. And it's a weird way to describe it, but you know, players will feel like they could still expand their economy enough in other ways. So their land eco, like trading villagers and going to berries and yeah, adding yeah. farms. That they're just like, well, okay, we're going to do that. And what I can't do is just like give this guy all the fish. And then what it turns into is like, then there's like, oh, he's on the water too. And then they're like, well, we got a triple commit and quadruple commit. So it's so funny. We will see probably thousands of resources invested yeah. into the water. And I'm not sure yeah. we're going to really have one player benefit all that much from it. Right now, it's two fishing ships for Jean Briot, though, which is, of course, huge. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it seems like the water is a really interesting gambit. If you could, if you can perhaps trick your opponent into over-investing, I mean, like right now, oh, yeah. I mean, Suman Guru is going to be eaten alive right now. Look at Jean Bureau just cornering and cooking the ships one by one. I mean, this looks like Jean Bureau's bay to have. Yeah, and he, he's going to get the connections. But but now again, it's like, do you add fishing ships? Because if you add fishing ships, your opponent's one or two demos away from killing them all. <laughs> it's so tricky, man. But man. this is where I love... Jean Bureau said, okay, I've got the edge on water. I haven't won it, but I've got the edge. What I'm going to do now with my Mongol bonus is I'm going to hunt on the extra deer. And this is showing amazing awareness from Jean Bureau. You've got the villagers out there taking that deer. This is textbook stuff, I would say, for how you would want to have opened here with the Mongols. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the kind of exceptional multitask. Oh, wait, and a forward barracks. Wow, that's wow. interesting. Okay. I... You know what makes it more interesting here is if you look at the scouting from Jean Bureau, He's checking to see if there's a barracks at home and he didn't see anything. 
He's never going to expect the military buildings to be in the middle. He may never know there's a military switch. And on the flip side, if you look at Samanguru's vision, as we still obviously have the water contest, Samanguru knows wow. the deer are there. He knows the deer are there because he scouted that, and you can see the deer in the fog. So the deer that his opponent's taking, he's aware of. So Jean Biro oh, could lose all those nice. villagers if he's not careful. And, you know, I don't know if he still does it, but I remember, you know, maybe 12, 18 months back, I was watching MBL build forward barracks, archery range, and stables like every single game. I don't know if this is like a suggestion <laughs> that maybe this is MBL on Sumon Guru, but I don't know that much about yeah. the styles generally. Yeah, I mean, and it's hard to, it's hard for anyone, even like myself who, you know, I've been living and breathing, dreaming about this for, for months. It's like, I, I don't have any data on when I've seen any of these players play Bay because we didn't use this in the qualifier and it's been a while since previous Hidden Cup. So like, I can't really tell you either. But what I could tell you is the scouting for Jean Biro is really important. I need to know, like, does Jean Biro, he knows his deer are being killed by the Spearman, which is really smart. But will he see this archery range? I think he might just catch a glimpse of it here with the scout to the left of our screens. Jean Biro definitely sees something and he sees it now. Oh, howdy. And we also see the vision for building upgrade was researched from Jean Biro. Just, I, you know, I can kind of imagine Jean Biro going, you know what? I have control over the water, but there's been a massive investment in the water area. So I just have to make sure that I don't wind up screwing up at home, getting counterattacked and losing everything. Very nice wall plopping down from Jean yep. Bureau. Hasn't yet got started taking to Castle Age, but I mean, I think Jean Bureau has had a magnificent opening so far. There's I, a lot of research. I love about. how Jean Bureau has actually just continued to run around with the Vils. And right now, Simanguru is like, he's either given up on chasing those villagers down, or he assumes that those villagers are not out there. There's still four villagers exposed out there. And they're still taking hunt, but it's so far away, and it's so untypical for the villagers to be out there that <laughs> he's not going to go find them right now. This is crazy. This is a wild situation in the game. And now, finally, clicking up to Castle from Jean Bureau. Um, I really feel like Sumon Guru is in a kind of awkward situation. I mean, yeah, you have more map vision, but it just feels like there's so much momentum mm -hmm. for Jean Bureau. Sumon Guru hasn't started going to Castle Age. Still uh, reasonably close to getting it, about 300 feet short, but I mean... Yeah, I mean, it, think about it this way. They both... To do to sort of pull ahead? I think walling at home is key. And actually, an interesting tidbit about the walls for Smunguru is he started to wall in an area where he would wall to the shoreline and then realized that the Navy there would deny that. So now he's adding a, another layer of walls here. Um... I think you gotta, at this point, expect that you're gonna lose map control and hope to drop that second town center behind your walls, kind of be able to relax a little bit and focus on economy and uh, deal with whatever pressure's coming because this is rough. I mean, they both went double commit to water. Jean Biro got the fish and now Jean Biro is Mongols getting all the hunt as well. Like this, this is the best of both worlds for Jean Biro. Things have really not gone as Smanguru would have wanted here. This is a fascinating follow-up from Jean Bureau. I mean, if I were in Sumanguru's shoes, I mean, Sumanguru now has absolute vision domination out of the front of Jean Bureau's base. We have these outposts that are being built, just saying howdy, just looking at what's going on, trying to poke away at the wood lines and so on. So you probably don't expect that there's a whole set of production buildings, including a stable going down, all the way out here by the mill. I mean, this is a lot of, oh my gosh, and didn't even scout that area. Oh, someone who can't even do the trick that you described before of seeing that yep. the deer have been picked off. So again, I would be like, all right, I have you walled in. Anything that you threaten me yeah. with, I'll see coming. And you know, you're probably going for town centers behind this, leveraging your you know extra economy from the fish and the control over the bay. And I mean, this could completely catch someone guru off guard. It is interesting that we see knights here. A lot of players like lancers. So... When we think of who these players might be, like Tato is someone who would probably go for Lancers, right? I mean, th there might be a greater list in viewers' minds. I mean, Knights are stronger in a lot of ways. That is also a very interesting TC to drop right next to the opponent's outpost. Nice. That would definitely leave me paranoid. But it just, 
knight as the option does make me think, and we have plus two armor on these knights as well. And now that TC. Wow. Oh, man. Jean Bureau, what are you doing, dude? You can't place that TC like that against archers. I mean, may maybe it was just an attempted gambit, you know? I'm going to begin to do this, so that way I can have a forward position against archers. And, I mean, there's two stables of knights building from behind, yeah. so either it gets done, or you surprise your opponent with a bunch of knights and get a bunch of guaranteed pickoffs on these crossbowmen. But look at these knights just one by one, marching their way in and trying to find some sort of weak point. Dude, this is... Dana, this is wild. We have, are going to have a Night Siege push on Suman Guru's base. And then we are going to have a crossbow a crossbow Siege push on Jean Bureau's base. <laughs> like both players are going to be pushing the other starting base here? What? Yeah, are we watching a 2v2? Like, what is this? This is insane. <laughs> and now, I mean, this, this is an awkward spot for Suman Guru because, I mean, as every player knows, if you start massing archers, you always get a little overconfident. You march them in, and when the entire archer ball is getting annihilated, you realize, I'm now 10 minutes away from getting any strong archer formation, period. And we can see, yeah. hey, starting to rebuild on that TC, maybe. We have knights that are beginning to flank around here. Oh, I mean, if Sumanguru can escape with these archers, that would be a really nice win to stabilize, because you have to deal with that siege push back home. Yeah, I agreed. It's really tricky. It felt like if the knights for Jean Bureau were actually just, if he made it simpler, if he made the knights from his base, he might have been able to deal with, uh, clear up this push. He will try and complete the TC again. No, Jean Bureau. No. No, dude, he thinks the TC is going to complete. The crossbows are <laughs> no! here again. No. Come on, get there one time. You just need to hammer it once more, but once is too much. Picks off every single villager, and now is just walking straight into the main base. Oh, 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 this is brutal. Well, this is chaos. The crossbows are through now. This TC has is, 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 is heard John Bureau's chances. He might not even have the lead anymore, but that means he needs to push and pressure at Suman Guru's base, which he is attempting to do. Remember, the knights are going to be produced from, like, the other side of the map, and you need quite a few of them there. And now... <laughs> Dude, this is insane! <laughs> both players could die to both of these pushes right now. I mean, this this is what makes Age of Empires 2 so thrilling to watch. I mean, the sheer multitasking and attention and focus that you need to make sure, gosh, what if my opponent also is countering with mangonels? I need to make sure that I'm microing mine against theirs. And now I'm constantly repositioning my villagers at home because there's crossbows in there. And here you see Suman yeah. Guru trying to carefully wall to make sure that there's not a single crack where those knights can slip through while trying to make sure that the crossbows don't get picked off. I mean, oh, look, there's the mangonel. It got converted? Is that what I am seeing here? Yeah, Redemption came in, and Sumanguru has made this big line of walls behind his TC so the knights don't dive. He used that Manganel to, to damage the other one. The other one's now gone down. And does Sumanguru have the lead right now? Is he actually ahead? He drops his second TC, and he still has those crossbows around. I mean, he must have the lead at the moment. I mean, this, this is stressful as hell, no matter who you are. And keep in mind, if you're Sumanguru, you might have stabilized, but look at how little real estate you have on the map. I mean, if yeah. these crossbows eventually go away, it is blue that has the map control. And here the knights are starting yep. to return home. Maybe, possibly, probably not. <laughs> it's very <laughs> well, hard to predict make a what's hole. <laughs> going to happen. Yeah, it, it's really messy. This is very... I mean, we haven't seen a lot of Bay games because of it only being a hidden cup main event map but this is not something we would have expected here it does look like oh bad timing both fish traps go down john bureau loses 200 wood there but he will finally finally kill these pesky crossbows in the back of his base i mean again i really feel like this is one of the more uncomfortable situations to be in as the archer player losing all of your impact on the map yeah you have some structures yeah. peppered about but when you have a lack of vision on a map that has a lot of dynamic elements to it, like the high ground at the far bottom right side. Oh my God, Suman Guru again. I feel like the sneaky town center is the Suman Guru special. Like just slipping <laughs> them out to try to get a little bit more of a foothold somewhere in the middle of the map. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have map control, it's a good technique. This is an awkward spot for a town center in general. Oh, well, 
Come at me, bro. I'm I'm <laughs> really excited. Friends. I'm really excited to see what John Brio has to decide to do here. I mean, I think he's going to have to delete every single building here because with redemption, these buildings can be converted. You don't want your opponent Wait, to have what? a siege workshop. He does have the knights over coming over. There's a lot of monks behind this, though. The siege workshop. It's not being targeted anymore, but oh, look how fast. Look at the cloning. Look how fast those monks were control grouped to the other knights there, Day9. This could tell us what type of player this is, if that's how quickly he sets his targets. So in StarCraft, we call that cloning, where you have like a group of units and you're trying to have each one individually do a thing to that specific one. And I mean, okay. I've tried to do this in Age of Empires too. And I mean, cloning in this game is so hard because of how quickly the knights move, how small the models are, and how easy it is yeah. to inadvertently tell five of your monks to target a single knight. I mean, this is incredible yeah. control and poise from Sumaguru. Yeah, I like how uh, then Jean Bureau goes in to start attacking again, sees that Sumaguru is paying attention, and eventually just deletes the Siege Workshop. But we do have Light Calf coming up behind this, which can help against the monks. Also, a lot of stone is being mined right now from Jean Bureau. So he will be able to drop a castle soon. And that's that's a scary sight if you're uh, the Italians or really anybody for that matter because mm. Mangadai just make this Mongol army even stronger. And I, I'm with you. I think everything you said is right. Like, yeah, monks can be strong, but monks are so slow here. And what Sumanguru is having a real problem with is he is sitting in his base all the time. And against mobility, that could be a massive problem here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, even this little sneak forward of a town center that's just a few tiles away from the starting one feels like a mile away when you have knights that are that strong and monks that are that slow. Every single time yeah. the monks get threatened, you have to pull back. And, oh, my God, look at this. A pair of knights have broken in, and they're targeting the critical gold for Suman Guru. There's and also we have a forward castle. Again, a, a castle. look at that. He's doing it again. He's doing it again. There's a castle coming up right now. What? This is the second game in this a row. This is beautiful. I mean, I was going to ask you where you place a castle with this sort of unusual open formation in the middle. And the answer is right in front of his face on his front <laughs> lawn. Drop the castle. And also, most notably, that's the only area near the main base where Simunguru can take stone. So that stone is now denied. Oh, there are point. more stones, but you have to travel across the map to get there. So... If you're thinking Genoese crossbow or thinking Trebs or just a defensive castle at all right now, if you're the Italian player, you've got to travel all the way out there to get stone. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I feel like RTS games are about positions, holding positions for a long period of time. And your whole strategy leads up to holding certain positions. And that castle down is such a critical point. Because, I mean, not only is there the stone there, but, I mean, the, the rallies and the motion from Suman Guru, he's going to have to crawl all along the bottom of the map. And here, the light cab swarming in, picking off all those monks. That's so much gold. Oh, my God. And the mangonels gold are down the drain. to push forward. The siege does get sniped, but more and more cav could be coming in here. And if you're losing crossbows to light cav, it could be a problem in another one. This is like the second straight game where Jean Vero just chooses chaos. And I think Suman Guru realizes because he sees the villains. I this one, Day9. I don't know about this one. This one might not go up. This might be a doubt castle, a oh, true doubt castle. No. Is it going to go up? What in the world is happening here? I mean, if here? it goes down, it's doubt. If it's Jean Bureau making it work, then it's not. I learned the meme. Uh, and right now, a castle slamming down from Suman Guru. And there's enough crossbows that it looks like there's going to be a slow repel. Doubt confirmed, T90. Look at this. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I like you, you learned the meme. Wow. I mean, I, I, this is the same thing as the previous game, though, where it feels like Jean Bureau should win because of all the a crazy aggression. But yet, Suman Guru has a crazy vil count. Like he's not dead again and we're gonna see the castle there what is this game oh. this is insane i like i've probably seen a few dozen bay games i know that doesn't seem like a lot but i've never seen a bay game have a double castle drop after both players siege pushed each other this is madness
Beautiful pressure from Jean Bureau. Look at how stupid this castle placement looks from Sumanguru. This castle placement is embarrassing, but you had to do it. You had to put the castle right there along the bottom edge, and Jean Bureau goes, oh, okay, cool. The spear will continue yep. to drive straight to the starting town center. And I think Suman Guru is gonna need to relocate down to the bottom right. Gonna need to rename this map evacuation as well. <laughs> yeah, so people call this map um, pants because they feel like the map looks like pants. And- uh, Oh, I can see it. Yeah. If you were to consider this pants, I consider it bay. But if you were to consider it pants, the belt region is becoming very important because that yeah. is an area where you can get more stone and gold. House wall, house wall, and house wall again here from Simon Guru as he defends his woodline. But he did just get a TC up on Golden Stone on the belt. So he's abandoning, yep. he's going to lose his corner, but he's going to have that area at least. Yeah, no, and he's, he's continuing to build more TCs in the lower pocket area, heading straight to the yes. zipper by the mid game. Um, <laughs> this works, this works. I can feel it. I can really feel it. And I mean, the pressure from yeah, so, Shonduro does appear to be kind of eh at this point on this right side. It looks like Sumanguru will be able to hold on, but this is annoying for sure. Yeah, and now Genoese crossbow have a bonus against cavalry. So they're very strong against like Kevin, very strong against knights. The problem is Jean Bureau just has units everywhere right now. So he's found damage there with those knights. He's got siege mixed in as well. But yet again, the theme continues. Somehow Sumanguru's on the way to imp. And remember the previous game? It was forward castles from Jean Bureau, defensive castle from Samanguru, and then he trebbed down the castles from his opponent, and then eventually won in the Imperial Age. It feels very similar what we're seeing right now. Yeah, five TCs from Sumanguru just holding on, holding on, holding on. This central castle from Jean Bureau does feel a little bit like, okay, I now can see that you probably have a stronger army than I do, and I'm going to need to try to maintain yep. a little bit of control. But I mean, this is a brave and calculated play from Suman Guru to shove into mid at this point, having the recognition that the pressure in the main base is petering out a little bit, that controlling the Agreed. belt and the left side of the map, that's going to be essential. But I mean, there were a lot of workers killed in the main base. It is still a worker lead from Jean Bureau. Still, is that a sixth TC? Goodness. Feels like it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he did lose quite a few of them, right? So it's hard to really keep track at this point, but it does feel like maybe four or five are out there, maybe six soon. Um, that castle got denied in the middle there. Jean Bureau, doubt confirmed because he couldn't complete that castle. And I I'm beginning <laughs> to be worried here for Jean Bureau simply because the Italian players got Genoese crossbowmen out. He's going to be an imp faster to be able to potentially treb down the two forward castles. But what a crazy... Like, I... <laughs> I I'm just... I'm kind of... I'm as speechless as someone who must talk about the game can be at the quality we're seeing here. I mean, this has been a remarkable series. And we are only one game down and in the middle of game two. And at this point, yeah, yeah. if you're Jean Bureau, that's a big scare moment. To hear that little trickle of Imperial Age arriving, this immediately says, yo you will be eventually losing these two castles in the main base. And all the while this yep. is going on, Suman Guru has picked up a relic. Always care about long-term relic control, even if the game is being really crazy. It's so easy to let that drop off, especially as a powerful 1100 rated player such as myself. <laughs> well, I mean, the castle spot that Jean Bureau wanted towards the middle, Suman Guru is going to take... So he is now castling. This is wild, dude. There's castles like everywhere. Castles for Jean Bureau may or may not go get treaded down. Again, though, I think the main thing is the big problem for the Mongols is actually how do you deal with Genoese crossbow? And it's going to be Onager as the research now. No. I mean, when I first played Age of Empires 2 and someone said that you upgrade a Mangonel to an Onager, I just said, I'll never need to know the name of this second one because I'm only going to make Mangonels <laughs> and I'm going to die in Castle Age. And I think this is like the first <laughs> pro game that I've seen someone researching Onagers. Maybe because I still yeah, and can't really tell the visual difference between them, but that's what you're here to help me out with, Tristan. Yeah, well, so Drill is the reason that this is a possibility. Drill makes the siege faster. So it's much more oh, difficult for these pros to then incredible. micro away from or move away from what's normally a slow and clunky onager. 
But we're going to have drill onagers. We're going to have light cav raids. We're going to have some crazy techs here. And again, the populations just continue to rise. I think Jean Bureau is finding some good opportunities here with the raids. Like, he clearly can see that there's some exposed areas here for Smunguru. And even though he's lost one of his forward castles, he's still finding villager picks. He's getting Hussar now. And he is... He, I mean... We might even oh see Siege Onager in this game. There's so many resources on this map. We could actually see Siege Onager realistically. I mean, this this is an this is an incredible amount of pressure that Jean Bureau has been keeping up. And I thought that it was all said and done once Imperial Age popped out for some Guru. But now Jean Bureau yep. has light cav raids slipping along the bottom, is now building. Ooh, that's a great castle placement. That is a clean way to secure the far right side of the map resources. And all the defensive lines coming out from Jean Bureau are just barely in range of some of those centralized goals. So it looks like the fish have dried up. Slowly, all these castles will eventually fall. But look at that great job from Jean Bureau gobbling up all the stone there before losing them. I, I gotta ask viewers watching this who is the player who would build random stables in different areas? Who is the player that would bring so much chaos with so many castle drops? This is a player who's clearly very unique and will stand out from the pack. I don't think there's gonna be many players who would play two games in a row like this. And then on the other side, it's like who can can survive from it day nine who could could somehow get to 200 pop and have all these castles amongst all the pressure and chaos it's unbelievable the level we're seeing here and it's really going to ramp up towards the middle because the the speedy onagers are waiting and there's trebs on the way for jean Piro. i mean this is oh no the hussar raid right through the center of the map i mean again this is a sort of lingering effect of two castles being there for so long the defensive yeah. uh, walls, the defensive lines just did not quite have time to get established. But look at these crossbow. Oh my God, those, oh my God, those seem so good. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, the Genoese crossbow, it's it's crazy bonus damage. I don't even think they're elite yet, but look at the rage. John Bureau is streaming Hussars in on the belt. He's streaming Hussars into the main eco from the shoreline. And he's also trebbing and onagering in the, or onaging uh, in towards the middle now. And Sumanguru has got all this army, but he cannot go anywhere near those onagers, or he could lose everything. I mean, the skill on display here is incredible because good, like, solid players would have died to that initial push. Amazing players yeah. would have barely held on against that a push. But, like, only the best in the world holds on and suddenly feels like the momentum is on their side after holding on that push. And I am similarly so impressed with Jean Bureau who is amazingly continuing to apply all these multi-point pressure in contrast to the real driving pressure of the castles early on. And now it looks like Jean Bureau is the one who has control of the center gold. And there's the castle going down. Shout it's the third to... castle in the same spot this game. <laughs> oh, and, it, and it's all going to go down too because there's there's a lot of army there. The Genoese crossbowman could maybe deny this. The onagers are going to wheel through. Okay, so so we've reached this point. Oh, here come the onagers! Here come the onagers! Here come the oh, onagers! Boom! No! Boom. Oh man, there's oh, just simply gosh. too many areas to look at right now. If you're Saman Guru, that's the problem. Is these Hussar raids take your attention away from your Genoese crossbow? Yes, yes. And I mean, if you just think about the seconds of micro, you need to stutter step to be effective with archers, with crossbowmen, and that stutter stepping is just extra seconds that you can't look at other locations on the map. This castle is going to fall. Yep. Three trebuchets pressing, pressing forward from Jean Bureau. And look at this, the immediate backup housing wall. And boy, you are right. Those onagers are speedy, man. Yeah, and it's like one mistake, then you lose all your, your big massive Genoese crossbowmen, and that's the end. But... But Hussar is in for Smunguru. He's got full armor already. I mean, his own Hussars will be very good at sniping down those Onagers. And the speed factor isn't that big of a deal when you have something speedy like the Hussar. And all of a sudden, the Onagers, wow. some of them are going to get picked off, not all of them. And I think the army might actually be superior for Smunguru in a second with Genoese and Hussar with Trebs on the way now. Incredible. Incredible. And I mean, there's still raids happening on the far left and all along the belt, but this is the focus point right now. If someone can control this area, oh my gosh, look at this very, very strong defensive castle right in the middle of the farmlands. And at this point, it is all about who can control this center region of the map. 
Yeah, and, and it seems like it's going to be Smonguru. Like, those Trebs are exposed there for Jean Bureau. He doesn't have a unit to stop the Hussar. Onager is now a non-factor. He's trying to go into Mangadai, which is an insane unit, but he will need castles for that. And it does seem like maybe... And, and, and my feeling is the Genoese Crossbowman will actually do very well against the Mangadai anyways. So, as we see the highlight here, like... My feeling at the moment is that without more onager shots like that, things are going to be really bad for Jean Biro. Oh, and we see thumb ring. We see extra ranged unit upgrades. Oh, finally conscription started from Jean Biro. Might be a transition to skirmishers to try to deal with these crossbow and then focus on using hussars as counterattacks. Because man, it is just not working yep. using the hussars to try to defend those onagers. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and uh, man, this is like. Unfortunately, if you're in Jean Bureau's position, you don't have a lot of time to think about it, and you might soon just simply have to test your strength of your units. Because if those Trebs make their way to the castles, you cannot go Mangadai anymore. You have to. There's eight Trebs for Smenguru. What? He's not. Unbelievable. <laughs> he, took, he took Do Not Trickle Treb way too seriously. It has eight Trebs. So, yeah, if he deploys on any castle, that castle is going to be gone. Wait, how many treb shots is it to pick off a castle? Uh, Has anyone ever asked? Is this the first time the question's been asked before? I said, well, I, I, you know, I always act like I know. I think it's like a 10, 11. It does depend on the upgrades, too. It depends. Like, here they're sure, firing sure. uphill, so it's going to take a few more. Oh, my God. Um, so it does depend, but that that's abnormal, the fact that that castle melted that quickly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that is one of the fastest castle drops, especially shooting uphill. And now we have raids happening on the blue side of the belt, but these Mangadai are doing a pretty good job chipping away. And oh, the trebuchets are exposed, but there's that giant mass of Genoese crossbow just ripping these Hussars apart. Still walks away with seven trebs remaining. For as crazy as it is for Genoese crossbow and their bonus against Cav, it is just as mind-blowing the bonus that Mangadai have against Siege. So if those Mangadai get anywhere close to the Siege, the Siege will disappear. And I, I think because Mangadai have so much attack, they should do pretty well against Genoese Crossbowmen as well. Now, the Meat Shield won't stick around for very long. But you can tell Jean Biro is yep. going to take this fight. It feels like he could do it, and he's dancing with the Hussars there. Look at him dance in the front just to distract some shots. Wow. This is where an extra I mean, onager or two, just like one or two onagers coming out of the blue could be really effective, I feel. Oh my goodness, is that a flood of stables in the middle of the map? I mean, these Hussar raids, if you've been glancing at the mini map, are ceaseless for Jean Bureau. But this giant push in the middle, this is both a huge moment for Suman Guru and a huge risk. That mass of crossbows yep. is slow. The incredibly mobile army from Jean Bureau just needs Suman Guru to make a single mistake. And that's seven trebuchets with no castle in sight, with no protection in sight. It is all in on can these crossbows deal enough damage to hold off this mobile force and the Hussar flying from below. I mean, I don't even know if it's worse to kill the trebuchets or if it's worse for the crossbowmen. It looks like Jean Bureau is swarming in and is ripping this giant death ball to shreds. This is insane. I mean, it's just so wild. All those trebs are going to go down while the fight for Jean Bureau, but at the same time, Sumanguru took out a castle. So there's not going to be near as many castles. There's also no belt control behind this. For Jean Bureau, he doesn't have the gold and the stone access, but now it's like, okay, are Genoese crossbowmen good anymore, or is it all going to be the Mangadai? Because it felt like the Mangadai Hussar combination was the combination for that wow. engagement. That was disgusting. And I mean, this is the danger of having a slow composition. Every victory means you get to step a little farther forward. With a mobile composition, every victory means you now have the ability to threaten every single worker on the entire map. I mean, look at this yeah, push absolutely. coming forward. And this is one location. There's all the stables here. So suddenly Jean Bureau has a key location to control where he can just pick off the Hussars one at a time as they come out. But continuous raids from Suman Guru all along the backside. And I don't know if this is maybe a little bit too over eager from Jean Bureau because again, more mobile compositions tend to be on average weaker than slower compositions. So if you're just can funneling see the... all of your cavalry through, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, I would love to see how many resources are remaining on the map at this point. This is a feature we added, and I think it's 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 going to have some relevance now. Because 
there can't be much golden stone left. Yeah, just 12k gold left. A lot of that's through the middle or on the belt. And then just 600 stone, which means if some player loses a castle, they're not going to be getting that back. Now, big engagement again. The Both of the range units are ripping through the Hussars, but it feels, still feels like, to me, the Mangadai and the Hussars feel a bit stronger here. Unbelievable. Jean Bureau slowly working through. And I love this percent gold of army calculation that you have in the bottom left. I mean, you can see 5,000 gold in those juicy Mangadai for Jean Bureau. But with all the Hussars continuing to come out one by one, I, I, I'm worried about Sumon Guru's ability to step in. And hey, the lone onager that you that you prophesized minutes ago. <laughs> I'm really interested to see. I think this becomes a wood game. I actually think this becomes a wood game because, like, look at John. If we could just get a glance through Jean Bureau's eco for a second, his main eco. Like, look, he's chopping wood there. He doesn't have wood in his base, and he only has two castles. So I actually think wood is a big issue for him. And it may not be for Samanguru because Samanguru's castles is are defending his wooden farm eco back at home. It's a crazy situation we have here. And I mean, at this point, like, when you say it's a wood game, I mean, there's still gold in the middle of the map. Does the game yep. transitioning to be more focused on the plentiful resources, food, wood, does this, does this change what positions that you care about as both players? 100%. Yeah, it's castle spots, right? So, like, the castle... For Jean Bureau is a big one on the on the uh, belt for the stone and gold, but I think the even if you're just looking at the mini map, where those castles are lined up for Semenguru, that is closer to some of the wood lines. But even even he could have a problem because it's not like it's not like there's that much wood around the castles. A lot of this wood is actually where the battle is. <laughs> wow, no, you're right, and you can see that these hussars are trying to slip through to the back. With the Genoese crossbow? Yeah, sure. Bring it on, oh, Hussars. Onager. We will rip you to shreds. <gasps> onager, Onager. There's the Onager. Onager's no. looking for his opportunity. And suddenly, Samandru, He's... with 45 Genoese, is going to have to back away because one Onager shot could flatten them. Oh, man. Look at how many health shot, bars there are But I don't think Samandru is going to let it happen. Oh my god, now suddenly these little tiny corridors between the stables, that used to be a strength to have the crossbowmen deal with the Hussars more easily to funnel them through these chokes, but now I'm getting so worried because it means the crossbow are going to be more clustered T90! I mean, literally a single crossbow shot, and that's, or excuse me, a single onager shot, and that's it for Sumanguru. Yep, and that is and that is what we will now see with the siege. It's going to be the occasional onager I honestly think Sumanguru might not make a trep for a long time because he's going to be where, I, as I say, that he queues up a trep, but he's going to be concerned that he can't do anything with his siege, right? So, so that is like, this is a pure army game, and I think with pure army games where you're not siege pushing positions anymore, Hussar raids can be king. And I look at Sumanguru, the fact he's yeah. got 80 on food, he's got he got crop rotation, he just raided some villagers, maybe. He might have the worst army, but if he can hold with his eco, maybe his position's better. It's all speculation at this point. This battle in the middle is ridiculously close. Yeah, I mean, Hussars are fallen one by one from Jean Bureau, but like you say, 80 farms to 40 farms. I mean, that means you're just going to be getting twice as many Hussars flooding in. And yes, the Mangadai are tearing them down, but this means that the Crossbow are finally getting to push forward. The gold area is now in... More control for Suman Guru. I mean, this is this is a scary spot to be in as Jean Bureau and the Hussars start ignoring the main army versus army fight and they just barrel into the main base. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am I really think that this game has taken a turn for the worst for Jean Bureau right now. Also, does he not have auto farm on? Could we have someone click the mill? Uh or someone, the observer. Mapu, could we find a mill at some point from Jean Bureau? Yes. I think he might not have auto farm, which which a lot of players will at this stage. And I do have a guess that no auto oh, farm on that's... at this stage of the game. Oh, man, that's a big tell for me, Day9, but I'll save it. I won't talk about it now because we've got Trebs from Simanguru, and he's brought it to the belt, and he wants desperately to take out that castle to eliminate more control from his opponent. I mean, I cannot believe how terrifying these trend pushes are on this thin little strip. And you see the manga die. What the? They're not even going to try to engage. They're going to try to just pick the trebuchets off. One goes down, two goes down. But at what cost? That is a lot of dead manga die right there. And we see that 
Sumagru still maxed out, 197 pop, but Jean Bureau dropped 30 after that engage. Great raids with the Hussars, though, and that is a nightmarish situation. There's just bodies everywhere. And when you are in a position where you're losing bills to raids, your new army or the army you have needs to go deal with that. And then what that doesn't present you with is an opportunity to go counter raid. And Sumanguru is simply just not letting the guy think, right? He's not giving him an opportunity to do anything that could damage him. And we have not looked in the red economy for like 20 minutes, right? We, we, like I talked about castle positions. We didn't even show it because the action's not even there. Like this economy is insane. He's got villagers everywhere on resources. And I, I think with 40 Hussars in queue, 40 Hussars in queue, 25 Genoese Unreal. crossbowmen in queue. Real. Like, he just can't be broken right now, which is incredible. And I mean, when you are nearly max and you have this much pressure jamming down your front door, it's so difficult to just even find the mental time to throw down a bunch of farms. And here the Mangadai going again for these suicide plays where they can pick off the trebuchets and hopefully just delay the push, delay the push, delay the push. If you can just get a few extra minutes to get a few extra farms up, a few extra walls with houses to make sure that these Husser raids get slowed down, maybe we can begin to think about counter pressure. Maybe we can think about trying to secure the gold. But I mean, Jean Bureau, yep. I mean, it's it's like watching a slow, steady, it's like it's like in the never ending story with the nothing gradually overtaking the map, man. <laughs> Sumanguru is gobbling up the middle. <laughs> he absolutely is, dude. And in the middle, he's had some of the additional gold spots and it feels like Jean Bureau has got to be sitting there thinking like, Kind of what we said in Dark Age, actually. I know the game's not over yet, but as a player, when you think you're dead, you are going to play on a bit longer, and he'll know he's not maxed. He will also remember game one and how close he was to winning there with Castle Drops, and now how game two, it hasn't worked with Castle Drops. And with random seeding and Hidden Cup, he's got to be like, who is my freaking opponent? Because I'm playing incredible, and none of my incredible plays have actually got me a victory yet. Yeah, I mean, this, this is... I mean, you mentioned this at the start. When you have two solid starts in a row where, wow, GG, Sumanguru is, leads the series two and zero after two games back to back with <laughs> castles being dropped in front of the nose of Sumanguru and Crazy. finishing and chewing into we the had... base. Like they, quote, succeeded. And then, and then Sumanguru wins somehow. It's. Yeah. Two games where multiple town centers where castle dropped, and multiple town centers were lost to castles. Like, and Sumanguru still somehow finds a way to come back in these games, despite up against crazy technologies. Game number one, of course, he was up against Conquistador, which was ridiculous. Here, he was up against elite Mangadai, the Mongol Hussars, the, the, the Drill Onagers. This is just an incredible, incredible hold from Sumanguru. Again, we have no clue who this player is. But, uh, I, you know, I think a big thing towards the later stages, we're going to actually sum this game up. Now, I asked production, I said, hey, let's get like, let's get defining moments of the game in here. Well, this was a very good game, right? But we go back, we see the whole story of this game. We had the demos. We then had those pesky crossbows. I honestly think that those crossbows were the MVPs. But day nine, I'm looking at this, and I was thinking at the time, there's no way Samanguru survives. How did he survive all this? So many bad things happened to him in this game. I mean, it, it, the resilience was astonishing. I mean, yes, look at this treb push in the middle that shows when everything worked out great. But look at the bottom left of the minimap at this moment. Look at these castles that are placed yep. hugging the bottom left, protecting virtually no territory. But that's what happens when you're under pressure. That's what happens. You just have to do anything you can to stay alive for a little bit longer. And I mean, the, the extra town centers from Sumanguru, I think, was the key to continuing to stabilize in yeah. that game. Game number three. Now, this is high tides. And as I explained earlier, high tides, it started off as high tide. And then that was Hidden Cup 3. Then Hidden Cup 4, I changed it too much. So I felt like it needed a different name. And then I named it to high tides. And now Ooh. it is still high tides, but with a tweak. So just to briefly overview this, in the north, you've got water. Now, there is not as many fish in the north as in the past, for those that have that past Hidden Cup knowledge. Expanding to the fish there is important. You also, of course, have the gold on the island if you end up fully securing that available. 
Uh, in the south, in this is re really where we made the big changes. There's now a huge reason to get resources there. You have more stone and gold there than ever wow. before, but also we have the shorefish. So a double click there will show the sh how much food is available on the shorefish on the water, and then also the hunt. So you're talking like maybe uh, my math skills are horrible, but I want to say about like five to six thousand food there on that strip, and I think that will possibly change people's approaches here on uh, high tides. Sorry about the uh, long-winded explanation there, my friend. <laughs> oh no, I'm I'm ready. I love getting the education. I mean, this is one of the the best parts about you know the kindness of you inviting me to be part of this. Just getting to learn more about some of this high-level strategy because these are the kinds of things that might be very stressful for someone like, you know, casually playing Age of Empires from time to time, understanding two or three maps, but getting the chance to yep. watch high-level players and think about it without having to figure out and execute the builds. My God, what a treat. And, you know, it, yeah, this dude, map, just and looking it's, it's... at the shape. Oh, my gosh, we're, get, we're getting delayed on, baby. <laughs> like you said, it's yeah, like it we're is. trying to pass each other in the hall in middle school where we're, like, both going in the same direction, stumbling across. <laughs> But this map looks like a very, very wide TC. Like there is almost no natural protection from tree lines, but there's so many mm -hmm. resources ultra far away. I mean, what are your considerations for opening on a map like high tides, plural, with that sort of lack of protection in the early game? So I think the theme, and I think explaining it as themes is good for anyone who's new, right? The theme, is anytime there is a place where you could build the dock and add fishing ships on deep fish, players are going to do it straight up always. Um, because that town center is a way to produce villagers. The dock is a way that you could produce fishing ships. Um, and right. um, by the way, day night, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm answering your question now. People are going to love it. Just, right, just right. go for it. Okay. Just go for it I'm whenever, for it. whenever Perfect. you desire. Um, so, you know, you have the docks in the north, and players are going to have to scout for that. But, you know, beyond that, where I think the concern is, if you invest too much to protect your fish or kill their fish, this map is wide open through the middle, so you could take some big right. losses on land. And I think it's a little different than some other maps. Like, they're fairly close together. You know where the opponent's DC is. So, I, I really just don't know um how much you want to invest into water because i feel like a well-timed man at arm rush or like a uh, fast archer play could just c kill three four villagers and then suddenly sure you have fishing ships yeah but you're completely dead well i remember like a year ago man at arms rush felt like all the rage i was seeing it in almost every ladder game that i played i was watching a lot of pros do it regularly is that yep. just due to the shift to these more unique non-arabia maps or is this just like a shift in the meta of players valuing things differently yeah i mean man at arms is a tricky one right now um i would say that the main thing that the main thing that dictates the viability of something like man at arms is actually uh or I, I, honestly any feudal age opening is really the maps and so for people on arabia for example arabia got to this point where it was like so consistent and so safe that people just said <laughs> go ahead and go man at arms because i'll just like quick wall in my bills and you'll do nothing to me um so here because you have extra food income and because you have the um the messiness aspect i think something like man at arms could become slightly more viable than say your standard arabia game so we'll see but we will carry on here. Second dock going up for Jean Bureau. And we also have the scouting there from Simangaru to notice that the second dock was going up, I believe. Now, if you don't see a second dock at all from Simangaru, that would imply that he's investing into land in some way. But we've not seen anything. And yet again, it's like whatever these builds are for Jean Bureau, man, he is off to a lightning quick start. And uh, some goats exchanged hands earlier. Semenguru is going to steal something there, but it looks like a barracks at home is the choice for Semenguru. It is not yeah. going to be the second dock. So in theory, the fishing ships should go down here for Semenguru because he's going for the land so, pressure. If I can sneak in with yet one more, let me learn the map style question. So on high tides, yeah. this yeah. bottom area looks so value. I mean, the stone 
is essential, as we saw last game, for just being able to afford enough castles to control enough open space. I mean, I'm looking at this map. Yep. Outside of the north, it is as open as it comes. I mean, how how do you time taking the south when the water in the north is so huge at this point? Yeah, I would say that because these build orders have to be so so tight, so well designed for what they're currently doing, this archer opening, or it could be scouts against the navy opening. Um, because of that, right now, and this is just all all like gauge for me because I haven't actually played a ton on this. I think having that four, five, six villager count walking across the map when you only have 23 vills would hurt your eco enough where they're not going to go right now. But I think when sure. you get to like, and I know that's like really overwhelming, like th there's someone listening right now and he's like, wait a second, you're telling me not only like a decision on where you go, but you're telling me if I walk too far, that's bad. Like, <laughs> uh, but, but seriously, at this level, I think that's the reasoning why we won't see it now. But actually, as we say it, right? You've already have your opening. You already no know way. what's happening in the north. You've made navy. You've made army. Now is the time. And I actually think a big meta switch here compared to previous high tides is before there was no other option. You had to have water. But now the land player can comfortably say, oh, shoot. Okay, go ahead. Take your fish. I'm going to have all that food, all those resources available to me down there in the south. And and somehow Jean is going to have to try and deny that at some point. That is such a clever point because, I mean, you're losing food on top to go for food on the bottom. And look at yeah. how many ships and how much wood has been invested in the north. And all of a sudden, Sumanguru is still able to have a whole bunch of workers on food. Actually has two more on food than Jean Bureau. That is, that is a lot of fishing mm -hmm. ships, though. So, I mean, this yeah, archer pressure coming ships. in, these close distances kicking in. I'm really curious to see the damage control now for Jean Bureau. Now... I've noticed, for those that are guessing players, because I saw a lot of people guessing MBL for Jean Bureau, MBL does have a tendency to to sometimes get housed. Now, I think it's a little overblown, but I, I've noticed a lot of instances where it's not happening right in the final moment. So I'm still, you know, as a big MBL fan, still kind of <laughs> keeping my, my eye on the whole house situation here. But this is messy. I mean, this is something he's clearly distracted elsewhere right now. Because that villager went right down. Man, I mean, the, the, these wood lines are so awkward for Jean Bureau. Yeah. I mean, it's really these two that are right next to each other. I mean, thank God for Jean Bureau that there's this little bit of tree that these archers have to walk around. But I mean, the very instant that Sumanguru hits Castle Age, gets a little bit more range, can poke a little bit more effectively. I mean, every single core resource for Jean Bureau feels completely exposed. Jean Bureau has so got, many dollars spent in the north. And we've got scouts coming too. So the scouts are there for the skirms. This follow-up from Samanguru is insane. And when we get a chance to look at it, what is funding this attack is actually the villagers in the south. So we've got vill more villagers wow, have arrived right. in the south to get all that food. Look at that. You've got villagers on the shore fish, the hunt, everything. And what this does is it kind of simplifies your game plan. You're just... You ever play a water map and have no clue what to do? Day nine, it's like that. You just don't make water. You just go for land units, and it makes life a whole lot simpler. <laughs> Advice for someone who doesn't know what to do? Let me write this down. <laughs> this sort of pressure <laughs> coming in for Sumanguru is just brutal. Yeah, the skirmishers are getting some great shots off on these archers, but more scouts coming in. I don't see any spearmen. I don't see any counters to the scouts lurking about. This is all idle TC time, or excuse me, idle villager time, and yep. increasingly poor trades. I'm seeing some really good micro here from Samanguru, like with consistency. And, yeah, wow. you know, I'm, I'm beginning to feel like, you know, this player doesn't feel to me like maybe a top three name, but maybe some of the really good aggressive players that we saw come through the qualifier, like maybe a Sebastian, maybe maybe a Hart could be Samanguru here. I don't know who Jean Bureau could be. There's still so many names to think about, and it's still so early, but I, I just cannot help but recognize a theme where we are seeing their red player being the aggressor each and every freaking time. Like, he's constantly on the offensive and that's a problem. Jean Bureau needs to find some way to counter yeah. this. 
And what's amazing to me is this is one of the first games where it has just been the raw offensive coming out. So often, Sumaguru is doing the counteroffensive. Oh, your knight siege pushing me? In go my crossbows to your main base. Yep. And we see now that when yep. Suman Guru is not trying to defend castle drops, defend conquistadors, defend pressure in the early, I mean, Jean Bureau is doing a, a super impressive job just stabilizing and continuing to slowly wall. But the amount of delay, I mean, look at that, 24 minutes of idle eco time for Jean Bureau. That's what this pressure and is this causing. And this was, if I'm remembering this correctly, this was the home map of Jean Bureau as well. So... Going down 3-0 wow. is obviously brutal, but to to get stomped on your home map like this, I mean, it, it's it's br maybe a little too harsh to say stomp. It was just maybe taking credit <laughs> away from him, but this is, um, I, I mean, I've been in this situation before. You got nine on stone, you're thinking, I'd love to go for a castle, but oh wait, I have to get the food to go feudal age first. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, or to go castle age first, so it's like such a desperate situation where usually the market is your best friend and right now we see castle age half done for suman guru and i mean in terms of a follow-up when you've done this sort of economic disruption do you try to leverage this by going for more town centers do you try to leverage this by going for your own forward castle taking inspiration from mm -hmm. your opponent the best players are going to upgrade this army maybe add in a little bit more and with their micro it'll be good enough to put their opponent in near the grave and then they just expand their economy behind it. So it's probably a mix of both. The way Simon Guru is playing, he's got no walls. He's got no defensive measures. He feels like he doesn't need it. I think he can just do a mix of both. And I think it's going to be really tough for Jean Bureau to hold over the next minute. Uh, that's such a great point because, like, you know, when you have too many options, it's so easy to just overdo it and you wind up yep. cutting all your pressure and you overbuild the economy. But just that that really simple, clean statement, dude, you just upgrade your economy, or excuse me, upgrade your units, and then you go for economy on the backside and try to leverage micro more than anything. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and I love the confidence again to continue to focus on expanding the mills in the South. You do still have the seven fishing ships. So it's a lot of food income here from John Bureau. If he can hold, if he could defend from this, if he can get a castle down, he is one of the best unique units in the game. But this crossbow timing from Semenguru, which he has tried to get pretty consistently throughout this series. He did so in game one. He did so in game two. He's done it again in game three. It is doing so much here. And the skirmishers are wow. disappearing. The towers are not going to be enough. The knights are coming in now as well. Knights and coming in. Poor Jean Bureau has got to be like, do I... Do I call it? Like, I don't want to call it. I'm almost in Castle Age, but oh, what a rough feeling this must be. Oh, I mean, look at these little islands where you have the only thing missing is a connection from the town center to each of these towers. And this area uh -huh. is where the archers are parked. And we see knights calmly walking in, using that durability to just start picking off workers one by one. I don't care if this tower is here. I'm not even going to bring my archers there. Finally, Jean Bureau gets to Castle Age. But what can you do? The problem is that you're still in the game. So you say GG and you get out of there. <laughs> classic, classic, classic. Well, yeah, I mean, I think everyone can relate to that. A lot of people realize they're dead. Wait till they're in the next stage. And then, uh, you know, just, just to let the opponent know, yeah, you killed me, but you didn't kill me that bad, right? I still made it to the castle <laughs> age, my friend. But yeah. I mean, listen... It's a bummer for Jean Bureau because game one and game number two were incredibly close, but that game was not, and Simon Guru has only been getting stronger. He utilized, he gave up the water, he utilized the food in the south, and he is now up 3-0 to open up his series in Hidden Cup. And th I mean, this, this is where it all started to fall apart. Basically, what had happened at this point, one player decided to go for the fish and the navy, and the other player decided to go for land. And, well, you could see at the very end here who ended up in the better position. The player who had the land control the whole way through with some beautiful crossbow micro. A lot of confidence with the yeah. way he's moving that army as well. Stop, like, he's microing underneath tower fire. A lot of players there would actually just leave the range of the tower. But he had the timings down perfectly. What a game from Simon Guru. Based on how Simon Guru is played... I think that I would want to avoid evacuation and I may want to avoid cross. So I would actually say slow it down, 
make it simple and go gold rush. And he says, screw you, T90. We're going to cross. This is the <laughs> final home map for, for John Bureau. And like, if he, if he wins this, right, he then has to play every single home map for the opponent. So it's going to be very tough from here. But if you just got here, the games have been really close. It's just, unfortunately, Saman Guru has that next, uh, that, that extra level of consistency, I suppose. This is the kind of map that I feel like might not align with the types of builds we've seen from Jean Bureau. Jean Bureau has appeared to have very calculated builds that try to get to a specific calculated point. We had the push in game one. We had the clean conquering of the bay in game two into the push in game two. In game three, clear yep. conquering of the north. Th those to me are signs of someone that has a really refined build that gets to a point. It's the multitasking that has been Jean Bureau's downfall. It's that Suman Guru is so good at doing these multiple things in multiple locations. And on a map like Cross, yes. where you are dealing with these four different areas, I mean, th this is a map that I just lose on. I have never won a game on this map, <laughs> at least not that I remember, because it's so hard to well, multitask when you have a dock here, a dock there, four different fronts happening with two units in each. It's it's so tricky, and I will, um, you know, perhaps give you even more appreciation for what the pros do here. This has about half the amount of fish in each pond that the uh, Four Lakes map does on the Definitive Edition. So if you're playing ranked and you get Four Lakes, and you make fishing ships, you can you can have those fishing ships working and bringing you benefit for a whole lot longer. Or you can be on just one pond and get a massive reward. But here. There's only eight fish per pond, and also the the fish that are there have a little bit less food. So the name wow, of the game here nice. is to use it, and then you can't plan for that to be your everything, which is why you're going to see players go, what is that? Sumanguru is walking across the map to build his first stop. Okay, I, I have a memory. I have a memory, and I... Who oh. is it? God, who is it? I remember a player... I think it was Jordan that did this once. Jordan? Oh my God, you're you're like one of the precogs from Minority uh, Report. You're twitching in your milk right now, having a vision, uh, trying what? to figure out who who is it that's going to commit the crime. It it was definitely. I'm not crazy. I mean, I am crazy, but I mean, I think I'm correct on this. I have a vivid memory of Jordan with Japanese docking the south. His initial dock was. Okay, we need stats people to help me out on here. Jordan definitely played a cross game. It wasn't in, in this hidden cup. Maybe it was the previous. He, like, walked across the map. But we'll, we'll get updates for everybody. But what the reason this is so crazy to me is players are almost always initially docking the safe area. They're not walking across right. the map to get a head start for the neutral area. And that's, that's a clever gambit because then if you are the first player to get some fishing ships down and you just scout that there is a dock, well, great. You can immediately begin yep. making military ships. And you know if your opponent is matching you one-to-one -one on military ships, hey, you're scooping up fish the whole time. So, I mean, yep. this is kind of interesting from Suman Guru, but frankly, Jean Bureau just is taking the safe fish and is effectively in, you know, equal uh an equilibrium with his opponent's economy so you know jean bureau i'm really curious if jean bureau just sticks with the one lake or whether it's going to be Sumon gurus trying to sprint forward yeah and contest it well i'm going to tell you why this is notable so if we look at jean bureau's scouting again that scout is in an area where he might like his, his scout was just in an area where he might send a vill to sneak and if you look at his scouting, mm, yeah. he's like, okay, I haven't scouted the whole shoreline, but I know that that pond is so close to my opponent's base that his fish will be there. So this influences strategy. We see sneak villagers all the time, and I think we're going to see it here. I Oh, no, it might be him checking to see if his opponent docked him, but, he's, but there is a chance. He's sneaking his own villager. You... He's... <laughs> oh, wait. Okay, I know who this is. I know who this is. I know who this is. This is Mihai. Or or um this is Mihai or Sebastian oh, Jean Bureau. This look is a trick at this. from the qualifier that Mihai did. Mihai also picked Huns two rounds in a row in the qualifier. And he's placing Palisades on the shoreline so his opponent can never dock his pawn. Now that was public. I did cast that in front of eight thousand viewers. 
but this is a Mihai confirmed moment, in my opinion. Either Mihai or Sebastian, who is his teammate. Oh man. I mean this but this is clever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that here's the thing. It's like I want to say Mihai confirmed, but like guys. 9,000 people saw it. Like, 8 or 9,000 people saw the trick, but it's gonna work! Look yeah. at Saman Karu! Saman Karu's on the way! And he wants to dock! And he's not gonna be oh, able to no. place a dock anywhere! Oh my Maybe god! Maybe he can build some of his so own walls level. and participate! Yeah, I mean, so, so here's what's interesting now, is that Jean Bureau is basically saying, no, 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 I, uh, I refuse to do this multi-screen management of all these different pressures. I own yeah, this yeah, lake, yeah. period. This is my uh -oh. lake. This lake was made for me. Oh, but the men at uh -oh. arms showing up some militia getting ready to smash in. Oh, well, yeah, this so, kind so of harassment. Remember, the crazy times here, right? This is what we said in the previous game, actually, where it's like on this map, when you have so many different things to focus on and it's so hard to protect everything, men at arms could be extremely strong, but the stable does actually right. complete so nice job there from from Jean Bureau, but that that's exciting, man. I think the palisading on the shoreline in two years will actually become more meta because that's not a big investment to deny an, a dock, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and I mean, if you can free up your brain space and free up yep. seconds here and there with just, I never needed to look there again, you're gonna be microing better. And of course, while this is happening, Suman Guru's still gonna need to be checking those, those docks. We see, the scout uh, plus spearman trying to fend off this men at arms push. And here it is, another <laughs> dock popping down. And we'll actually see if Suman Guru can do, you know, the sort of presumed stronger micro, the presumed, um, you know, flood of military ships in that right lake sooner. But at this point, I'm just, I mean, Suman Guru kind of needs to deal some damage with this push. Yeah, I agreed. And, you know, the skirms are coming out now. I'm just laughing because. Pretty soon, Jean Bureau is going to start to fish there. And there's not going to be much left, actually, because his opponent got yeah. quite a head start. Now, I think he does see his opponent's fish and immediately moves his fishing ship so he could try and kill those. Which does make me think, actually, big advantage right now for Jean Bureau. If he can kill those seven fishing ships, that's like a, here, it's your birthday. Free fishing ship kills for you. Uh, it, it makes the forward dock so weird to me. Well, I mean, you could, I guess you could think in Suman Guru's shoes that this is a long-term play. If I can take this, mine it out, then I can get the two lakes that are on my side of the map and overall have yeah. a few more bursts of food. And this is very, very heads-up play from Jean Bureau, just sending those scouts back to the shoreline to kind of check, yo, 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 are you actually taking these fish? And now yeah. a little harassment on the gold line. Hey, Jean Bureau's starting to be able to apply a little pressure now. Ooh, interesting there. The scout's distracted. The wall didn't actually pan out there. Now we have village. Now there's there must be something else happening here, or maybe Sumanguru is just going to reposition his villager. Really interesting how John Biro seems to have so much respect for his opponent's quick walls, and we haven't seen too many. It could also indicate as we do have the quick wall. What did I say? What did I Caster say? Curse. Maybe that's why. Yeah. Oh man, beautiful job there from Sumanguru. Well, I mean, at this point, the game is finally beginning to calm down a bit. No one's yet clicked up to Castle Age. We see a little bit of harassment on the wood line. But, I mean, I feel like these kind of slower armies that are archers and men-at-arms and a spearman or two, like, these these always feel a little bit easier to deal with than the scouts that can dart forward, as we saw in Game 3. Yeah, especially if you've got skirms out there at this point with Fletching, which is coming in. This could be really strong. Two villagers for Jean Bureau go down, though, to that attack. And it's unfortunate because he was just moments away from actually saving those. But again, it's just it does feel like Sumanguru's got a little bit more of an edge when it comes to the, the unit micro on land. I do still feel like, I mean, nine fishing ships, ten fishing ships should be going down here soon on that right side. And Jean Bureau could maybe get the full clear up as we see the supplies upgrade right now, which... It's a little bit of a meme because it, you don't see it in the early game from pros very frequently. It saves food on your militia line. This indicates we're not going to see one. We're not going to see two. We're going to see like 10 more man at arms maybe for that to pay off. I mean, that's wild. I mean, I only ever really see a lot of infantry line units in, you know, feudal age and then not really in yeah. castle age. Then maybe in imperial age when you just get a whole bunch of long swordsmen up. 
But I mean, at this point, I mean, is, is, is there a reasonable amount of pressure that you can do with feudal and castle age militia line? I, you can, if you get in. You're allowed to say no. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, let's say juicy. let's say I'm gonna give it 10% chance, and the 10% chance is what people feast on when it comes to their their you know favorite videos and their favorite series of oh, any yeah. tournament. Like this is gonna come hot and heavy. And Jean Bureau, if you look at him, he's back at home. He is not at all expecting this attack because he has not scouted it. Now he's killing all those fish. There's not much fish there anyways, but here come the man at arms and you cannot house fall because you are Huns and you cannot Wild. build houses. So you need to quick gate or do whatever you can because right now there is no way to stop those man at arms from pushing back your skirms. This could get crazy here. And now trying to throw down an archery range as part of the wall. We have some stone walls going up as well. I mean, I just, I literally have I never seen this before. Yeah, I think honestly, as, as players are going to be so resistant to this idea, you might want to consider, if you think it's going to get bad, you might want to consider a tower. Now, it seems like he's holding it off. He's actually researching bloodlines out of the stable because his plan is probably cav archers, and that will apply to the cav archers. Um, sure, seems sure. like he's okay. But yeah, Sumangaru using the market's going to click up, but I would say advantage John Bureau right now. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget that top lake has just been operating full steam ahead. It's been doing great. I mean, yeah, there's been a whole bunch of stuff collected on that right lake. But I mean, if I'm looking at the Dravidian economy, you've just started the left lake. No one has taken south. There's a, look at these stone walls. I refuse to be broken on this side. It's I mean, smart. It's really smart. Has, yeah. Yeah. He's stable. Like, He's stabilized. I think this area is like the one area that could give him problems. And this is a map where things can get crazy really fast. So he goes for the stone walls. It allows him to go to Castle Age without not having as much army. He's now making cav archers. And uh, he's got the eco lead. So, you know, the problem here is we've seen this before. Where Jean Bureau has had a lead. And Sumanguru is just not able to be killed off. So I'm really yeah, excited yeah, to yeah, see yeah. Sumanguru and see if he can survive this one. Because it does actually feel a little bit worse and any of the situations that I recall from this series. <laughs> or Suman Guru is like, oh, thank God I'm behind now. Oh, finally I can play from behind <laughs> and make a comeback. <laughs> I mean, this has been some next level gameplay from Suman Guru and great call on the Cav Archers. And wow, that's, that's also another really smart follow-up. If you are building the Cav Archers, which effectively guarantee you don't need to worry about men at arms out in the middle of the map, you can just start chewing away at them. Now you have the control and you can begin to do yet another push. And you know what? If I was a betting man, I might think there would be a castle coming out from Jean Bureau alongside that Manganel push. Yeah, yeah, I could I could see it. I mean, he hasn't gone to stone yet. It definitely felt like maybe the castle energy, if you could call it that, is from a player. If we do think it's someone like Mihai or Sebastian, uh, two of the youngest players in the scene, they will come into this with a bit of an underdog mentality. Maybe, like, that was their thought. It's like, I don't just want to roll over and die. I want to make sure that I'm really applying insane amounts of pressure. But we won't find out who these players are, of course, until the final day. We can only speculate for now, but so far the Siege and the Cav Archers are going to break their way through. There's still no massive damage yet, though. It is all beginning to add up, though. Yeah, I mean, are there specific things to do against a Cav Archer Manganel push? I mean, I've just not been against it myself. Um, usually you need a combination as well. But I think if you're ever up against an Archer unit and Siege, you can, in theory, with Superior Micro, simply use Siege in defense, right? Because you're, oh, you would normally sure, make sure. siege against archers. So in these situations, I actually find the best players will counterattack with their own archers. And they will siege defense, which is precisely what Samanguru is doing. Because he's like, I'm not going to give you the fight you already have. I don't need that army in yeah. defense. I can use the siege for defense and I can maybe surprise you. This is next level stuff or for Hidden Cup, we call it next lever. And this could hit that wood line. <laughs> and if Jean Bureau is incredibly unlucky, I think even an overchop on the wood line could be happening soon because I recall that wood line was really exposed before. Big moment here. Big moment. Oh, Cav wow. archers run through. Crossbows are on the wood line. And a couple villagers do go down. 
But that's just not that big of a deal when you have stone walls protecting that. The archers are never getting through that. Yep. This is great heads up play yep. from Jean Bureau, going for the Cav archers and knowing, hey, if, as long as I know I never need to worry about getting counterattacked at home, I can pressure as much as I want with these things. And now all of a sudden we have Cav archers, oh. not just in the main base of Jean Bureau, but they are breaking through and they're gonna be on the gold and on the wood line. You have to cancel the house to get out. Sumanguru is in a tight spot. Yeah, this is huge. And I love how Jean Bureau said, oh, okay, I don't see your crossbows. Great, I'm running through. Fine, you don't show me enough resistance. Then I will take my moment while I have it. He could potentially lose his cav archers. I <laughs> do not know what that... <laughs> that, that was terrifying. Oh, hell <laughs> that, yeah. Professional broadcast. <laughs> that was terrifying. Um, the cav archers get the hill. I might need a moment. Thank you, production. And the crossbows come back to try and trap the cav archers. And they will actually kind of block off the Cav Archers, oh man, what a, again, every game has been so freaking good in this series. I love it. I mean, what a treat. And you can see Jean Bureau, there's a gear that we're seeing him pull. That's not a phrase. We're seeing him do something different this game, Tristan. We don't see He was the out of gear castle. there, dude. He was in neutral right I know. There. He was in neutral. He went to the market and he found up. a new gear. Yeah, no, like he <laughs> isn't building another castle. We see he went immediately into a second TC. Yes, we see pressure continuing, but there is a, a smoother economic transition happening behind. And for the first time in this series, when Jean Bureau is applying pressure, he is doing so while ahead yeah. on villager count. And look, he's getting yes. more ahead. He's building another TC at this crucial wood line to make sure that archers can't pressure it. He's doing all these economic moves in such a way that he is still fending off pressure. And look, the bottom lake is his Good. too. Woo! Yep, has some fishing ships there, but the Siege Micro has kept Sumanguru in this, I have to say. And you know, Dravidian Skirms do fire faster. It could be really strong against uh, Cav Archers if the opponent's Siege isn't a factor. Um, you know, there is this feeling. Now, this is, this is I think, just my, uh, my experience of playing so many Hun Wars, because there was a period where people only played Huns v. Huns, which I'll maintain is still, like, 10 times better than 50% of the matchups you can get in random Civ Arabia. But anyways, I digress. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're when you're <laughs> floating all this food, okay, after all this, you're just spending wood and you're just spending gold on cav archers and mangonels, and you're losing your siege. Like that's oh. a big shot there potentially. Maybe this gets problematic. I would love to see a consideration of mixing in knights combined with the cav archers. It's oh, so strong with the hunts. Nice. God, I can imagine. I mean, we already saw Jean Bureau do great things with Hus Husser Mangadai. You know, a little bit of the same. Yep. yep. Again, but look, three yep. TCs to two TCs, and a random elephant hoping that it can participate, but everyone continues to ignore him. Three of the four lakes <laughs> in control for Jean Bureau. And I mean, at this point, I feel like this is when we would be saying, yep, looks like Jean Bureau has an advantage. And this would be when Suman Guru would instantly tech up to Imperial Age. I wonder if he's going to be doing it and have the same sort of counter pushback pressure. But I mean, these Cav Archers have so much value gobbled up from them. I mean, these have been amazing for Jean Bureau. Yeah, and they're cheap with the Huns. They're cheap. And you know, as you say it, right? It feels like with the skirms going down, the crossbow number's kind of low for Sumanguru. It feels like maybe Jean Bureau, even down three games, is gonna sit here and think, I'm not gonna go for Knights. I'm gonna go Imp. I see the food count climbing, the gold counts climbing. Nice. So I, I could see that being a possibility soon. And I mean, like these exchanges, wow, that's Ooh. the first pretty bad exchange that we've seen happen out of Jean Bureau. And I mean, I feel like whenever you have a super fragile set of units, like a bunch of cav archers, you start hitting that critical mass, you start feeling really overconfident, and then you mess up just once, and suddenly, it's just like we were talking about with losing your archers to a counterattack push. Suddenly you have no pressure. And hey, the ever yep. familiar forward castle, and enough for Jean Bureau to tech to Imperial Age. Yeah, good micro with the siege from both. They have the same numbers. It does feel like the castle should go up behind this, and beautiful job. That's all you need to do if you're Jean Bureau. Just kill the freaking elephant. Get it out of the way, dude. Yep. That elephant. <laughs> why? Why is <laughs> no one killing elephant. this elephant? <laughs> they must have had like a. It's the first elephant of the series, man. They're really valuing it. Um, 
But yeah, the, the, our, the fight was good enough for Jean Briot to get the castle up. He is on the way to Imp. So in the Imperial Age, he could treb from that position and he could tech up his Cav Archers. I just do worry. There's a slight chance because I'm staring at a 3-0 on the scoreboard. I, I do yeah. feel like still, because Suman Karu has not been killed easily, that maybe Suman Karu can use this moment. Oh God, to run into a town center. No, oh, that's not oh. what we meant. Oh, oh man, geez. Suman okay. Karu has been so good about being efficient in this series. So good about being careful and sturdy. And that's one of the, the a rare flub from Suman Guru to lose that many archers. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I'm still really like, you know, the thing I want to come back to here because the guessing game is so fun. Again, shout out to Elephant, <laughs> who may switch sides mm -hmm. here. But I still can't get over the Palisades on the shoreline and how we only saw one player do that during the qualifier. I really, I really wonder if that's yeah. going to make everyone think it is that player. But... Maybe it's somebody else that saw that and thought it was a good idea. I, I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, are, are there players in the top 16 that are known for specific build order preparations as like their main maneuver? Because I feel like that's the yeah, consistent yeah. theme we've seen out of Jean Bureau. Yeah, I would say like the castle drops are typical of someone like Yo, someone like Doubt. Um, Ganji did do it a lot as well during the qualifiers. Um, those would be the three players that come to mind, but, um, you know, there, it, it's like th what we were talking about with this Palisade and hello, Elephant. Elephant still continues to survive. Uh, the Palisades is very unique. That is like not something that is typical for most yeah, players. Yeah. What a Ooh, game. And that's always the what scariest a fun game. And the GG's out. just called, actually. He just Instant. calls it. Smangru's like, I'm already up 3-0. He doesn't even try and fight when he sees Imp. And, uh, well, finally, Jean Briot gets one on the board, and it felt like he could have had two or three on the board at this point. Finally, he's able to finish off his opponent, who wasted no time resigning there. I don't know if that's a tell for anybody, but it did feel like he, he, he could have maybe fought a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, we have to... I, I still have a lot of sympathy for that poor elephant that really felt like it was the <laughs> person at the party who doesn't know anyone. It was just wandering around trying to make friends and just was trying to just participate, you know, and then it just eventually wasted away. I mean, Sumon Guru, so, with this quick take of this, like, right lake, I mean, it had some benefit, but, I mean, Jean Bureau felt solid this game. Just sturdy. He was did. not thrown off the game plan. Solid. Yep, solid. He was, he defended from the initial pressure, which we had, I think, questioned at times, can he defend from that pressure? And then he was the one dictating the pace of the game. He got in with these Cav Archers, and it felt like this was the moment. Like, right here, that was the critical moment. Obviously, at this point, big eco lead for Jean Bureau at, for some time. Of course, the Elephant makes a reappearance. But um, at the end of the day, with the imp time, with the upgrades, it felt like Suman Guru was going to get crumbled there. And he felt the same. And it is going to be oh, Gold baby. Rush for the next game. Let's go. You know, this, this so, is the kind of map that I just think is is so violent. It is so, because I mean, there is <laughs> the location to care about. It is the middle. It's not like something like what we saw in High Tides where, hey, there's the top and there's the bottom, but then there's this area in the middle and you're trying to weigh each one against each other. Look at that, there's gold there, get the gold. How much gold is there? All the gold, okay, go there. It's so cutthroat. And I feel like the sort of build order preparation that we've seen from Jean Bureau and the precision of those timings might really benefit on this sort of map. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and it is, it, it then comes down to the classic, well, when do you do it? When are you going to take it? Because um, at, you know, on Tuesdays when I may cover like Loie the Legends, you see uh, some of the noobs go out there in Dark Age and they're like, okay, I'm going to mine as much gold in the middle. Never mind the fact that I lost three <laughs> villagers to wolves. I'm going to mine the, the gold in the middle. Oh, a fourth villager to a wolf? Oh, whatever, because I've got the gold in the middle. Dude, and they'll sometimes wolves use are the, tough. I'll take as much in the middle as possible and then I'll save the other gold for later. That's right. I've got little leftover gold. Everyone knows leftover gold. Just right alongside leftover pizza is better than original, right? Hilarious side note. Truth, truth. The first person to ever explain this concept to me, my older brother, T90 Bro, is in chat right now, which is rare occurrence. He's a big lurker. Ooh. He said legit strat in my humble opinion. 
<laughs> um, so, so to continue on, right? The timing on when you go to the gold is critical, and and you know we made it sound so hype and so exciting. What these guys are going to do? They're going to protect their villagers. We're probably just going to see some walls, and they're going to use the gold they have in their base to then fund the control and the uh, you know the the protection of the middle. Yeah, I mean the that that joke that you're making about the timing of the mid. I mean, in one of my first games on Gold Rush, I was like, I'm not going to be a newbie and go for it too soon. I'm going to go for it <laughs> in the middle of feudal age, right? Like, and then I yeah. attacked a castle age immediately, throw down a castle, and I just did not have enough food or wood to do literally anything. And I had 1,800 gold, and I felt like <laughs> such a trust fund baby. You know, I was absolutely going to crush everything. But like the. I feel like this this map is one of the sharper demonstrations of the importance of a good timing push and a good build. Because if we know that this area is really important to contest, and if you get to Castle Age and you can get the right amount of archers to push out, or even delay until you let your opponent take and then counter push, you really just need the one correct play to seize control of the middle. Yes. It's not like, you know, as we were saying before, when you have these maps that are really open, where there's resources spread out all over everywhere. Like the first map we saw on slopes, the left side was getting killed, so the right side was taken. Then the right side got killed, so the left side was retaken. And then you push through the middle. It's all about the middle. And so I, I'm very, very, very keen on trying to see what the builds, the specific timings that uh, these players are going to be going for. Because, you know, you have to have one. You don't have that much gold on this map in your main base. You have what? Four patches? Five patches? You've got you've got seven tiles, which uh, quick math amounts to uh, seven times uh, fifty six hundred. Hey, I hey I said it when it was on hey. screen, but you guys could trust that I definitely got that. Um, Tristan always you know, closes his wanna... eyes when he does math. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, funnily enough, I did have my eyes closed. Believe it or not, that's how hard my brain was working there. <laughs> yeah, in calculation or in prayer of doing math live on air, it's tough to know. <laughs> Yeah, I just combined the two. So um, <laughs> I do want to say, so I, I don't know who I'm speaking to, right? We've got a lot of people watching. You know, you you have made it clear that you're maybe not the the most uh, informed Gold Rush player, but based on your explanation. Um, so I do want to make it clear how this Gold Rush works, because if you play the, the version that's in the game, the Gold Rush version, the version that should be maybe the better version... I find there's a bit of an issue with it because you can't have two people in the middle at the same time or two people getting gold at the same time. It is very, the the normal yeah. ladder version and devs, this is not in any way, any shade to try and get you to change the ladder version to make it better for everybody. I think that'd be great. It, I'm not, it's just a side note. Um, You know, the, the normal version in the game is like you get the middle, you win, right? But here, both players have flat region where they could both have some of the middle, right? So you could realistically have both players sharing mm. the well not sharing but you know taking some gold but then you also still have that center hill and I, I point that out because there might be some people who are like why are they not just all inning to the middle it's because there's like always a spot to fortify there's so many different areas to be at and um you know i yeah, do feel like yeah. that's why a lot of these games have have actually seen both players have quite a few villagers in the middle later on yeah, I mean, that's a great point that, yes, there is the most gold in the middle, but you literally cannot mine all of it at once and do something useful with it. Otherwise, you're going to have yeah, 50 yeah, villagers yeah. mining gold, and you're going to be broke. You're going to be making out of one TC and barely affording it. So, yeah, like, e each player getting their respective bite of the donut established first, that's a really interesting point. Because, mm -hmm. you know, then this kind of removes some of the ladder-style pressure of only one may own the middle. Yeah, so more general question. We've obviously had a lot of time to break down Gold Rush here. More general question. What is your earliest Age of Empires 2 memory? Like, did you have someone show you this game? Did you find the game? Did what what's your what's your story with Age 2? Oh my gosh. Okay, so it actually begins with Age of Empires 1, where I okay. I really wanted Age of Empires 1 because back before the internet was really a thing, I you know, I would get PC Gamer magazine and I would see that there were like cool articles about games or I would just go to the store and oh, see cool box art. I gotta like, interrupt oh my you. God, I gotta play I this. gotta interrupt you. Yeah. 
I'm the worst. I got to interrupt you. This could be a big deal. Villager could go down. Quick wall. No quick wall. Scout's weak. Okay, continue. Everything's fine. Oh, continue. no. Is the scout going to go? Okay, okay. I thought I thought we had a lull. I thought we had a lull. These players are too high level. Um, but yeah, no. So I, I, I went to my grandmother and I wanted to invent chores for me to do that she could pay me for. So that way I could eventually buy this Ooh. game. So she, she Ooh. happily invented all sorts of unbelievably useless things to do. You know, like my grandpa yep. was a mechanical engineer. So she's like, well, your grandpa, he, he needs some help with his work. And my grandpa had me hammer nails into a block of wood for nothing. Like just <laughs> put the nail in the block of wood. And I got a little money for that, you know, and then, <laughs> and then I, you know, I ate all of my dinner instead of leaving some left over. So I got a little bit of money for that. And I, I did a bunch of these <laughs> chores. And then I eventually got Age of Empires 1. And like, it was the most amazing thing ever. Just like building farms and like <laughs> researching ballistics for the first time, allowing your catapults to actually deal any damage to anything. And I didn't yeah. play Age of Empires for a very, very long time. And then I just sort of went, man, I miss some of those old games. You know, let me just play some Age of Empires too. And this was maybe in 2021. 20, and I had no idea about the competitive scene. I had had a friend tell me about how weird and unusual the economy in this game is compared to StarCraft. That you actually have insane mm -hmm. ramping in a way that you really don't see in the StarCraft games. And so I was like, yeah, yeah. I'll give it a shot. And that's where I first learned about this entire wonderful community. I got to say, I think the Age of Empires community is one of the best communities in all of gaming. I mean, all the pros are just such incredible advocates for the game. They're all such, you know, amazing communicators in interviews. The coverage is exceptional. A lot of your stuff is amazing. Low Elo Legends is hilarious. And it's just it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. It just feels like I, I found this hidden gem. Um, so just cheers to all of you and to Age of Empires too. Well, thank you. I mean, listen, I, um, I I wasn't expecting this to turn into, you know, a compliment of the community. I just wanted a story, but I, yeah. I say with some bias, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in other games. I kind of, this is my corner of the internet. I don't really look elsewhere, you know. Um, Straight up. But that's kind of been my feeling as well, you know. Um, we're a little bit more mature, responsible, whatever it may be on in some cases we're not of course but um yeah i i don't know what it is exactly but i feel like we're very lucky and the other thing which is so cool you talked about just like how people act and how people are and the options we've got what i find is cool is oh, even yeah. with the top 16 there's always these things that can separate people right i could be wrong but i think it speaks to the depth of age of empires 2 that there can be these tiny little tweaks and separations between players who are so good um, but oh, it also yeah. speaks to, I think, how lucky we got. Because I imagine, like, I, I, I would guess, like, if this game had, I don't know, if it was just released last year and the prize pools were, like, 200K per tournament, tournament, I don't know what other esports are doing. It wouldn't surprise me if, like, every player <laughs> ended up being the same type of player, you know? But here, it's like, we've got a wide variety. I really enjoy that. Oh my god, the, the the depth and the skill expression in this game is out of control. And I, I really credit a lot of the semi-randomization of the maps that really forces you to improvising big chunks of your build order. Because, I mean, that was yeah. that was one of my main focuses in StarCraft 1, was I always had very, 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 very sharp build orders. And, you know, that game, yeah. it is very easy to die. Um, and so, yeah. hey, if you have a good build order, you're just picking up wins very cleanly in almost the exact same way in 60% of the games. But this game, every every single match seems very unpredictable. And, uh, you know, even right now where both players are playing very turtly at this point in time, I just think to how different this game is than every single one we've seen between these two today. Mm -hmm. That's just, it's it's amazing. And, it, and that's why everyone who's in this event, everyone who is in the freaking qualifier pretty much, has been playing this game a lot to get here. You need to play a lot in my case. If I were to tell you how many hours I've spent with my eyes on Age of Empires, whether that be casting or playing, I would immediately become very embarrassed. <laughs> but um, I think that's also <laughs> the beauty of it. And that's why the game is still around. You know, that's why, like, it yeah. doesn't get old. So. Oh, God. Yeah, no, it, so, there's something amazing about a game where you dig a little deeper and it just gives you more. Every time you ask for a yeah, little bit yeah, more yeah, interesting yeah. stuff, the game's like, I got it for you. Yeah. I got more. So. To the game, there was there was a pause, and we had fourteen question mark. Sim responds with the yes, so it starts the game already. Yes, 
John Beru says oops. So I don't know how many oops players are in the top 16, but oops is not a common phrase that players are, are saying. Um, immediately I've got uh, data people, please look and see who said oops before. But um, you know, right now it's 54 <laughs> villagers against 44. Vill lead is there for Usman Guru, and the eco is climbing, but Burgundians on the other side have those cheaper eco upgrades, which can go a long way. So um, I advantage right now to Usman Guru, but he doesn't have map control to get relics. And we still have a lot of things that could happen here to, to truly try and control the gold yeah. in the middle. Yeah, I mean, the relics seem like an interesting hedge because if there's going to be so much focus on the gold in the middle, just having some guaranteed trickle, no matter you know how often you need to pull on or off gold, that could be an interesting long-term yeah. play. I mean, I hear that beautiful twinkle sound. Like, I mean, that da -na -na is like one of the <laughs> the trigger noises <laughs> for me. I'm like, oh, oh, oh my God, it's really like, <laughs> oh yeah dude thanks mapu um but yeah no I, it looks like we're gonna wind up with kind of an interesting scout war in the middle just to maintain that map mm -hmm. control to get your first foot planted not necessarily with castles or tcs or anything that is too committal but just to get a look yeah so th this is where you you it would feel very natural with so many like having scouts on the field for both players to actually consider what we're seeing teched into by Smenger right now. Why go Cav into Cav when you could just mix in the counter to Cav, right? And um, it's not a game where the Cav are going to break in any whole wall or find any like real crucial spots to raid like the previous game, for example. This is a game where, okay, we do have Villager going down here, but you know, this is a game where it's more about one spot. And so a unit that's that's slower like the pikeman makes a lot of sense here and the fortunate thing for jean bureau is he actually gets a heads up on it so he now knows his opponents on pikeman and is building another barracks and it's so nice to know that your opponent has those pikemen it gives you much more comfort moving out with your monks to try to capture those relics or just to try to do conversions mm -hmm. you just know that you have a little bit of space and a little bit of time because you know that they need to stay centered and stay pinned around those spearmen. And there's another barracks finishing now. No one's yet going for the relic in the middle. And uh, still lots of economic upgrades coming out and just not a lot of construction in the mid map. We haven't really seen the plans mm -hmm. unfold for these players yet. Yeah, and, and you know, the interesting thing to me too is both players are on stone. Both players are ramping up army production. And I think both players might want to castle in the middle here instead of a TC on the safe gold because they have not built the TC yet. It would have felt natural right. to do that. But if they're not, I'm thinking it's because they're trying to save the stone. And ooh, man, Sumanguru found some damage on the other side, but now he's, he's got some monks on him that can convert the pikes, loses a villager, a bit awkward here. And there go the vills headed towards the middle. No, no, are we gonna go all the way and just build right next to this barracks? I mean, hey, that's a way to deal with gold rush. You don't even worry about the gold. You just build a castle and try to end the game. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you do it oh, against a player no. going pikeman, it could be really going to actually... Wow, town center, the top of the hill. You know, I don't mind that because it goes up faster than a castle does. And he didn't have the stone for a castle anyways. And I think if he waited much longer, this could have been problematic. He may just have to toss away his army here just so he can give his villagers oh, time like to build. Oh, no. oh, no. Oh, quick walls, maybe. Get Hit it once. Hit it once. Oh, my God. Oh, that was so close. More quick walls going down, and this this feels so dangerous. The relic, I did not know that that was an obstruction that matched a wall. And now it looks like, <laughs> oh, unbelievable, the counter castle. The counter castle. I mean, that's definitely going to go down for Suman Guru. Yeah. There's way too many pikemen here. All the knights, all the scouts falling. Just really stubborn play from Jean Bureau. You understand exactly what just happened, though. He took the fight because he knew his TC would be denied, be denied if he didn't. But the pikeman count is finally just caught up with Jean Bureau here. And he, while he has control of the hill, isn't going to be able to use that TC because of that castle that's just been dropped there from Sumenguru. So I, I got to question the lack of pikeman. I haven't really questioned much in this series. I think the level has been really good. But to not add any of your own pikeman or to think that you could just take the middle with only five or six light cav. Definitely a bit questionable for the player who needs yeah. to make sure he doesn't lose again here. And this is the pattern we've seen in so many of these games. Jean Bureau tries to make some plays 
And while Suman Guru is holding it off, gathering enough, enough resources to get to Imperial Age. So suddenly, Jean Bureau just going to feel like he's stabilizing and boom, Imperial Age is up. Trebuchets are knocking down the walls. Oh, a very nearly excellent quick wall to trap those cavalry. But still, it looks like advantage is slowly building for Suman Guru. Sean, the, how you just described that is exactly how I would describe my quick walls. A nearly excellent quick wall. That happens to me so frequently. <laughs> I, like, I, I cannot I explain to you myself. how many times... I cannot explain to you how many times I've almost had a quick wall that I feel like I'd share with the whole world and it'd be clipped and shared everywhere. But then it's just, it, just, it just doesn't work out. So that's... Dude, uh, everyone gets that hungry. Would be on I'm going to go life. viral. <laughs> <laughs> the nearly excellent quick wall is very relatable, and I'm sure other people relate too. <laughs> and man, Jean Bureau, though, did not delay going up to Imperial. Staying neck and neck, both of them have right around 100 villagers, but it's that much larger army from Sumanguru that, you know, normally would say, hey, it might not be as high value, it might actually be a lot of pikemen, but those are great if you are getting lots of trebuchets this quickly to control the gold. That's exactly what you want yeah. against someone that's shown that they're building a lot of stables. Yeah, agreed. Now, this is where I find the Bengalis to be very awkward. So what's great about them, and it's a bonus I should have touched on, the Bengalis get plus two villagers uh, from their town centers when they arrive to the next stage. So that means with currently, I think, four TCs or maybe three, he's going to get even you know a big spike of eco here. The problem with the Bengalis is they can't make knights. They don't get gunpowder, and a lot of these times it's like gunpowder and trebs, and maybe, you know, that, that's about it. Uh, the Burgundians, on the other hand, have amazing gunpowder, and the ranges are set up to go for hand ah. cannons. So what Jean Bureau is going to have to hope for is that his tech is better, and that he can complete chemistry in time to get the gunpowder flowing. I mean, right now, it is all about the timing of the next bit of time. Let me, yep. That's the worst sentence that's ever left my the mouth. Timing of <laughs> try to mulligan that, try it again. Um, we'll edit it out. The yeah. next few minutes feel essential for Jean Bureau because we can see straight in the middle of the map, Suman Guru is already gobbling up that centralized gold. So, hey, maybe you Whoa. do get pushed off your center gold. Oh, wow. Yeah, Immediate um, pressure. Look on at this. the wall. Like, this is this is something I think everyone should do but people don't put enough importance. We have a full stone wall, ah. legend of wall. He knows like, hey, I've got middle. The only way you break me is if you distract <laughs> me and raid my base. So I'm gonna wall yeah. everything. That's crazy. I mean, it, it is just focusing everything on the center of the map. Whoever gets to control in this engagement will win. And now, I mean, you see Jean Bureau does not have any safe mining in the center of the map. Mm -hmm. None at all. Yeah. Trying to get some skirms out to push back all these pikemen. Maybe this one trebuchet can do a little bit of counter pressure, but I mean, quickly, 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 this castle is going to be going down unless all of these workers can repair it quickly enough. But I mean, that's a lot of money down the tubes, almost out of stone for Jean Bureau. Yeah, yeah so you, you like, you really gotta hope that you don't need a castle in the near future because you're certainly not gonna have this one. And then you've sunk more stone in the holding this. Now he's doing that so he can make bomber cannons, so he can make hand cannons. And he does have the bomber cannon on the way. Chemistry just completed. He may nice. have some hand cannons as well. But it feels like this timing for Semenguru has been perfect. He, he's going to likely take out this castle, and then he can take his time and think about what decision, what, what unit he wants to make next. Right. I, I mean, like, this stone wall, okay, it's going to defend against this counter pressure, but... Is this the right time to do that sort of stone wall investment? Because it doesn't look like we see any expensive units coming out of Suman Guru. It's just a lot of pikemen, skirms, and just these trebs. Yeah, yeah, I think some of this is the awkwardness of the Bengalis. Like, he feels like, I don't know what to make, so I'm just going to make some skirms and pikes mixed together. But you are right. Like, if, if Suman Guru starts to lose the castle in the middle, he might regret sinking into all these stone walls. But he's continuing. I, I appreciate a man who commits to the walls. People who do, do wall, like stonewall half their base, but then have palisades still remaining on the other half, and then the units break through anyways, that, that never works. So if you're going to wall, you got to go the full way. And that's what Saman Guru is doing here. But, uh, I mean, the populations have evened out. There's still gold accessible here for Jean Bureau. Mm. He's still mining it 
on that right side, uh, right of the middle rather, and he clears up the units there, maybe he can get a push towards the middle with a few Bombard Cannons. Man, that would be a huge swing for Jean Bureau. I mean, almost all the production infrastructure is also sitting pretty in mid. And I remember you were saying that Jean Bureau might transition to gunpowder units in addition to the Bombard Cannons. Yeah. I, I thought he was going to do that. He's making skirms now. Uh, I think he's decided, even though my opponent has albs, even though my opponent has good monks, the only way that I could truly get a big punch back into this game is if I go for Paladin. So he's going to go for Paladin. Paladin and wow. Skirms with some seeds. interesting. Could possibly do things here. Well, especially, I mean, you know that Jean Bureau, all those archery ranges, Suman Guru saw them. And there's Skirms continuing yep. to pour out of them. It's, it's natural for Suman Guru to assume that there's going to be something much more focused around archery tech at this point. I mean, the problem with the Paladins is, I mean, stone walls, ugh. I mean, nothing's getting through that easily. It's all focused right yeah, in the Yeah, you think like point. So, maybe if you really had your horses trained, you could maybe hop that, right? Get a hill and just, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not yeah. a horse guy, you know? Advanced to I, I age don't really five know. to get the jet packs. Yeah, I'm like... just, yeah, I mean, they never try it is my thing. And I feel like if you were going to die, if your whole civilization was going to be eliminated, you would give it a shot. Um, but yeah, they can't do that. And Paladin's on the way. Bombard Cannons and Trebs mixed together here. This is where it just becomes so awkward. We, like we said it, it's awkward to play as the Megalis, but you know what makes it awkward? Nobody ever has the resources or has the guts to try and go for elite battle elephant. And that's exactly what is being oh pecked my... right now by Suman Guru, who did just convert a Bombard Cannon. No this way. Everyone except Suman Guru is a coward. Everyone needs to learn from the brave <laughs> Sumon Guru and get battle elephants. Yes. And I mean, this it's just... is now finally the big counteroffensive, but here they are. It's elephant time. Time to use those tusks, baby. Are there monks on the side of Jean Bureau? It looks like there's one. A single monk is out. Yeah, just, just a single monk. And the Trebs still stand for Sumon Guru. The, the paladins didn't do it. And he's like, I see your paladins. And I raise you... 100 HP or whatever the number is that the elephants have over the paladins. It's a <laughs> the lot. The biggest it's horse like of all. The elephant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to win him the series. This is going to win him the series. Just like 12 I don't believe to 15 it. of these elephants is going to push Jean Bureau out of the middle. The castle will fall. And then Jean obviously will fall out of Hidden Cup here. The Burgundians wow. have been so good throughout the qualifier. They would win all the time. We did not see them in galleys that frequently. We never saw Elite Battle Elephant. And the theme continues of players going oh. for these techs and going for these strats My that God. no one would have predicted coming into the day. I mean, we were talking about the idea of Jean Bureau using the unique techs of these units. And look at the glory of these elephants, man. They are just pouring in. This is beautiful. Rolling in two by two like they're boarding the Ark. But instead, they're here to bring <laughs> Suman Guru to the round of eight. The castle desperately trying to get repaired. But I mean, I just don't know if there's enough time to build counters to these. I mean, sure, pikemen are great. Monks are great. But the elephants have so much health. And what a glorious way to close the series. Yeah, what a what a great way and, and what a momentum swing for a player, right? You win that way. You had some close games that you're able to bring it back. And then you put the real like cherry on top with the Bengali elephants at the end. It was a crazy uh, finish after a relatively slow buildup. But the economy did it, man. The economy. And then I think what funded those elephants was the middle gold control. It was just, Jean Bureau just did not do enough to protect the middle. He just thought he could stay on light calf. And it was very a bit one-sided. I thought he was going to also switch into the pikes. But I, I think also, I don't want to take too much away from Smanguru here as we sum up this series in a bit. This is the end of this game. We'll, we'll get to the series. Like, I cannot over or restate this enough. Like, 4-1 scoreline, sure. This could have gone to seven games. This was really close yeah. with some of the wins for Smanguru earlier on. I mean, th those first two games are some of the best games of H2 I've ever seen. 
they could have gone either way about 10 times per match. I just can't believe yeah, the true. skill level of both of these players in the series. What, what, what incredible demonstrations of composure under pressure. Yeah, I think um, that is something that, you know, we're, we're looking at the top 16. So everyone's going to be really good. It can be a couple moments here or there, a little bit of extra grit, a little bit of extra, uh, you know, an, an extra strategy in the strategy book, per se. That can make the difference dropping out of the first round and between you advancing forward. So that's the way I see that series. I think that Suman Guru is also going to have some nice lessons to learn. I think that in some ways yeah, to have won that series, but also be like, ooh, I could have lost that. I could have lost that. That's kind of good for a player in some ways. So, um, I mean, great series from from whoever that player was. We, of course, don't know. They move on. And then John Bureau is out. So uh, sad times for all the John Bureau fans. I mean, still, if you're a Jean Bureau fan, what a what a treat you got to see. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. the castle pushes. I mean, I especially just loved mobile ranged units and mangonels to seize control and then just grab the entire middle of the map with castles. I mean, that is yeah. like something that can apply that so to cool. a huge number of civs. Ooh, I'm going to be doing that cheesy stuff next time I'm queuing. Yeah, make army, drop the forward castle. It's always a great thing to go for. Um. Yeah, I don't know if we're if we got the highlights of the series yet. Uh, still day one, or if we're headed to the polls. But viewers, obviously, stick around. I want to talk. Uh, we're gonna do some gifted subs. I also want to talk about how the week's gonna go, how Hidden Cup plays out, and then also people are gonna vote or have the opportunity to vote right now on who they think these players are out of our top sixteen. Please vote on who you yeah. think Saman Guru was in the chat. And of course, we need to let you know that though the computer program is trying to parse through it as quickly as possible, you know, T90 and I are reading every single message that you post, those thoughtful messages, every yes. single digit that you type in, we wholeheartedly agree with. And wow. Yes. And please, 44%. if you felt like this was, if you felt like this is the best commentary possible, please type a number in the chat. Thank you very much. We all, oh, guys, we appreciate it so much. So, yeah, Jordan, 44%. Yo, 11. MBL, 7. That is pretty landslide towards Jordan wow. there. Huh. Okay. I could see it. I could see it. A lot of Jordan tendencies. He he played very clean. He played very consistent. The thing I describe about Jordan is he's got an elite level. He doesn't have, like, those crazy highlight moments all the time. Um, But I could see a lot of the the way he played describing him now we move on to the next poll the losing player who is now out of hidden cup vote away who do you think jean bureau was i think a lot of people are going to say mihai because uh, i think of the un unfortunately the loss right because a player who came in from the qualifier might be more favored to lose first round but then also sure. it was palisades on cross day nine the that moment there he's the only player actually that's not true He's the only player in Hidden Cup main event who ever did it. The only player I remember doing it was actually Dark, um, which was also in the qualifier, and Dark is not on our list. So we'll see. Yeah, no, I mean, like, like the idea of a qualifier player uh, doing a particular tell plus yep. just getting narrowly outclassed by the opponent, that, you know, that checks out. That makes sense. I would, I would vote Mihai, but then again... T90, you said Mihai, and I was like, sure, that's it. <laughs> I don't know how many other people in the chat are like me. I'm just like, listen, if T90 says so, that's the way it is. 56% going for Mihai 06. Yeah, 56. All right. So according to viewers at home, this was Jordan, who is the semifinalist in Hidden Cup 4 against Mihai, who is, uh, I think, the youngest player, actually, in Hidden Cup. I think he's mm. 20. Nice. Yeah, so he was wow. born after the game came out which is a fun stat that I have to Gross. somehow digest. Yeah. Yeah. My friend, thank you for joining. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the cast. The series was amazing. I wish that would have gone to seven with how good those games were, but I had so much fun. Oh, it was a delight. And thank you so, so much for the invite. I'd love to come back whenever. I just think that Age of Empires 2 is just such a deep, rich, amazing game. And it's so unpredictable throughout all of it. So thank you again so much. And thanks everyone at home for hanging out with me too. It was a blast. Absolutely, man. Thank you again. I'll see you around, all right?